Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and I'm delighted to have my good friend Gerald Clark and a returning guest back today. And we've got a special show today. Uh, we have been doing a series of podcasts on his latest book, uh, Seventh Planet Mercury Rising. But today we're going to take a little break from those podcasts uh, for a breather. Uh, we're still going to be on the subject of uh, the Anunnaki and we're going to talk about their home planet of Nibiru. And this is going to be a Nibiru special. And I asked Gerald to do this for a specific reason because... Well, there is quite a Nibiru frenzy out there, and uh, you know, um, big questions: is it is it real? Is it is it coming our way? Um, we're going to get into that, but I, I don't want to do a normal show. I want to do this from a scientific and logical perspective. And there's no better person to do this than Gerald Clark. And uh, of course, you can follow um, Gerald Clark's work on GeraldClark77.com. Uh, you can see everything that Gerald does there, and he has a wealth of information on the Sumerian culture, and he is an independent Assyriologist, and I, I like to coin that term for Gerald because it's exactly what he is. Um, but today we're going to focus on Nibiru, and we're going to get into, you know, so many things, what we know, analysis, everything we've got, everything we've got, and we're going to synthesize the data that's out there. Uh, with the purpose of coming up with some answers for the public, because the people really are hungry for this, and it's incredibly important uh, um, so without further ado, let's bring on today's guest. Hi, Gerald. You're very welcome back to Capricorn Radio. Hey, buddy. It's really good to be back. And <clears throat> it is uh, timely that we do this. We said we said we were going to do it. And so I think, you know, and based on spending an entire week of focused on nothing but looking into this, I think uh, I think we have a lot to share. Sure. Uh, Gerald, just for, the, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, in preparation for this, you've actually wrote an article. I, I call it an article because it's, it's a quite a large document, Gerald. Uh, it's like a mini book, to be honest with you. Uh, and you are prolific in everything you do, Gerald. And that's why I asked you, particularly for this show today, uh, to do this from a scientist's uh, perspective and a, and a logical perspective. And you have the goods in that respect, uh, Gerald. Um, but I'm just going to refer people to uh, this document, this article that you have done on the Nibiru analysis. And uh, you'll catch that in the YouTube description. Uh, you'll have a link to your site for that as well, GeraldClark77.com. It's an incredibly important document you've done too, Gerald, because you have done analysis with graphs, tables, um uh, King's List, you've, you, you've tried to, uh, that many angles to try and figure out any information we can about Nibiru. Um, like, like I say, is it coming our way? Is it even real? What do we know about it? What, what can we, what can we guess and what can we reduce down to, you know, at least a window of, uh, a window of opportunity of kind of, you know, pinpointing some sort of estimation on anything to do with this whole scenario. But, uh, so I'll just refer to the audience to that, Gerald. But I, I guess, um, for me, the, 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 the first thing, and I want to mention this, Gerald, is, is Hamlet's Mill. For me, the, the, the Nibiru source that I first came across was Hamlet's Mill, uh, a book by, uh, Giorgio de Santiano and Hirsch von Deccan. And, you know, it, it's an archaeoastronomy Bible, if you will. And, you know, it's been around since the 50s and 60s, Gerald. Uh, in, 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 um, this is an MIT professor, a history of science and, uh, uh, you know, he's been fully uh, aware of this whole Nibiru, saying that it was the brightest star in the sky. He says there's many other tales in the Sumerian stuff, but this is one that people are going to have to wake up to, and they have to get over this uh, label of mythology and start looking at this in an archaeoastronomy aspect, putting in this comparative mythology and archaeoastronomy and trying to synthesize it, Gerald. Yeah, I just looked at that, <clears throat> the reference that you gave me on that book, Mm -hmm. And I was reading through the portion that he was discussing on the Enuma Elish and talking about uh, the names of the planets in their part particular celestial battle. And uh, I was I was fascinated to see that he had access to a version where he was using the name of the Anunnaki home planet, calling it Nibiru, not Marduk, the way the ba old Babylonian version did. Once, once Marduk was in ascendancy, he... He changed the Enuma Elish so that he made their home planet his name. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew this, and Sitchin knew it as well. But I, I was looking for another source that would corroborate that, and this one did it. Oh, and awesome. I was really excited to see that. Awesome. Yeah, and of course, uh, I'm going to leave that up in the box as well, Gerald, for people that want to follow Hamlet's Mill. It's actually a, it's a, it's a book that you can get. You can get the whole book online. Uh, it's got many ancient cultures in there. It's got many things in there from uh, the, basically the history of procession and, you know, a lot of archaeoastronomy. All the alternative archaeoastronomers today, they all draw source material from this book. It, it was like, 
Now, one of the most important books of the 20th century for me, Gerald, um, and it's got so much in it. Uh, it's just, it's, it, there's a small segment on Nibiru in there. And there's many stuff in there, but Sumerian and yeah, Babylon. I, I think it's, a, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing that it goes back to the 1950s as well. Mm. Um, oh, some of this research does, you know, it's like it's been floating around down there. Um, uh, you know, we're going to get to Harrington's research as well. Um, we're going to get some of the ERAS data and the satellite stuff. We're going to get some of the science, general. But, I mean, let's talk about the Sumerians' kings list. Uh, I want you to tell me, you know, what, what this has got to do with Nibiru. Why, why the flood significance to Nibiru? Uh, and tell me why we're going to get into the Sumerian kings list first to tackle the Nibiru question. Well, you know, when I first started talking about Sumerians, I had to talk about a couple of stories out of the Bible that would connect the Western culture over to uh, the Middle Eastern uh, historical record. And one of those was the story of Noah, of course. Well, in that story, everybody knows it ended in a flood. So people have tried to pin down when Noah's flood is to determine when that was to use it as a marker point in history. Well, if it's true that that flood was caused by the passage of Nibiru, then you could use that point in time to say, okay, it passed here, let's uh, add another 3,600 years, 3,600, and, you know, see when's it going to come by again. That's, that's the whole idea. Mm. So the reason the Sumerian Kings list is important is because it lists at the end of the first uh, rulership, and it took 240,400 years. This is table one from the document I wrote. Then the flood swept over. And uh, then the next document picks up for the Sumerian Kings list and says, after the flood. So it's talking about a great flood that happened. Now, the question is, is that Noah's flood? Because we know from Solon, when he went to, to the city of Sais in Egypt to find out about the history of the, the Greek people, in particular about Atlantis, um, they told him there were multiple floods, four major ones, and multiple minor ones. Mm -hmm. So we don't. So we don't. So what I was trying to do with this first point was <clears throat> using the uh, dates of the rulership. Could we land at Noah's flood, which we believe, I believe personally, was uh, at the end of the last ice age. So I think it was about 10,000 BC. Personally, some people believe it was 2,900 BC. So this this is where it comes down to is if you could figure pinpoint that and you believe the assumption that it was caused by Nibiru, you'd have a passage point in history. Okay, this is one of the angles I tried to come at it from. Uh, and I did multiple angles, <laughs> as any scientist would, to try to get to the truth here. And that's what's going to come out tonight, uh, hopefully. And I <laughs> I was actually surprised at the outcome. So I'm actually very pleased, just <laughs> to let you know up, up front. Now, so I followed this. So what did I do? I said, well, Enki says he landed here between 450,000 years ago, according to Sitchin's timetable. And in some of the other sources, it could have been earlier, as early as 360,000 years ago. So I took the conservative one, 360,000 years, subtracted 240,400 from the first rulers from the Sumerian kings list that ended with a borrowed tutu. And uh, I came up with, uh, what did I come up with? hundred I think 119,000, something like that. So what, so that, oh yeah, it was 119,600 years. So I looked at that and said, well, that may have been a flood, but it certainly wasn't the 10,000 BCE. So I found, I thought that was a dead end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the thing that was in question there was what was the actual date to use from Enki's arrival in order to start from prehistory and go forward to the flood. All right. So that was the first attempt. The next attempt was to go, okay, well, let's go after the flood. Find the Sumerian king, because we have all their reigns, so we have the time that we could accumulate. Find a Sumerian king that was documented to be in the record so that we had a firm date in stone that he was actually a ruler there, and then work backwards to see what that time was for the flood. So I did that as well. And their total uh, rulership for all the way to the point where they switched cities was 17,980 years, and that ended with Aga. Of Kish. Okay. So uh, just prior to him was en, en Mebarajsi, and he served for 900 years. And according to this, he was the earliest ruler on the list that was confirmed independently from epigraphical sources. So I thought, okay, well, let's start from him, work backwards to the flood date that was given at the end of the first part of the king's list, and see where that landed us. Because he, so you just take 2600 and start. Uh, 
adding these dates of these previous rulers. Uh, so add 2,600 to about 16,000. And, and all of a sudden you see again, you're not close to, uh, the, to the 2,900 BCE flood that they claim. And also the one that we think happened at, uh, the end of the last ice age. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is the problem with that approach. And so I found that as a dead end as well. From a scientific standpoint, it doesn't hold water. Sure. Um, but yeah. they said there was a there was a great flood there. So uh, it looks like in the if you work backwards and just using the last king on the on the list, that was seventeen thousand nine hundred and eighty years. Let's call it eighteen thousand plus uh, twenty six hundred. So that would be almost twenty thousand BC, uh, which is way longer than the one that we were trying to work to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so I I really didn't. It really didn't help me that much. Now, it says that in 2900 BC, uh, they did find a sediment layer all the way up to uh, an area. I think it was Sapar. No, no, it was. They found localized flooding at Sharupak and, and other layers that they found. And they radiocarbon dated it to 2900 BC. But this could have been one of the minor floods, too. So it doesn't really, you know, it, it's not convincing to me. You know, I just read an article uh, before I did the show. Actually, for a multitude of different reasons, uh, I was doing Irish mythology, and there is a sunken, uh, not a sunken city, there's a buried city on the west coast of Ireland that's been buried with a flood deposit. It's some sort of a black uh, mud or flood layer. Purports to be about 4,000 BC, Gerald. Uh, it looks like there was a tsunami came in of some sort and hit the west of Ireland and buried a settlement there. Um but it, yeah, well, another piece of evidence I had from way back in history it just came to me. When I was going back and forth to Turkey, I remember them finding this vessel um, in the Sea of Marmara that apparently had been washed there from a flood that came in through the north from the Black Sea that spilled over the Strait of Bosphorus and washed this vessel down uh, into the bottom of the, of, the, of the ocean there. And they also found a bunch of farmhouses at the bottom of the Black Sea. Maybe the thing never made it over the Strait of Bosphorus, but... It was at the bottom of the sea, the, the Black Sea or the Sea of Marmara. And they date, they dated when they thought this event happened. And it turned out to be approximately 10,000 BCE, which was, you know, or, you know, I'm sorry, about 10,000 years ago, which was about 12,000 BCE. And it turned out to be, you know, at the end of the last ice age. So mm-hmm. uh, a lot of uh, evidence shows that a lot of the waters all around the Mediterranean rose a significant portion around that same time. So I think that was the, the flood of Noah. And, and, you know, there, there's been multiple ones, though. So this this planet is is flood prone. Sure, sure. You know, it's, inc- it's an important line of inquiry for Nibiru, though, Gerald. I, I, I get why you started yeah, off like that. Right. Because if Nibiru is coming close to us, we're going to get flood activity. We're going to get... It depends how close it crosses, though. If, if it's a planet of the crossing, uh, which, which is what it's described as, it depends how close it gets to us, Gerald. Do, I mean, there's sometimes it comes past us in, in, in the orbit and it doesn't affect us that much, though, Gerald. Is that correct? That's right. It really just, it really just depends on whether, um, <clears throat> it, where the Earth is when it causes its disturbances with the sun. And, you know, so if it's, if, whether it's on the leeward or the windward side, essentially, you know. Sure. So if you're on the, if you're on the downward side where the radiation can come off the sun, and strike the Earth due to its interactions with Nibiru, then then that's a real problem. So, uh, on top of that, I guess one of the worst problems is the magnetic effect uh, in causing the planet to wobble about its its polar orbit, mm-hmm. which would cause uh, great disturbances on a watery planet. And that seems to be the ongoing historical record, flood after flood after flood, whether it's a major or minor one. So it really is a function of, uh, like you said, where Nibiru is when it comes through. Now, is there anything in the chronology, um, it's a vital line of research, Gerald, for these Nibiru passings, is there anything in the chronology that we can say is a definite? Well, I, I, I thought I had some definite points from my Sumerian readings before, and I was glomming on to 3760 BCE because it seemed like a very important one. I was going to go and look up the story that was connected to that to see if I, it had any legs. And uh, I, I didn't get around to looking back at that one. But I thought, well, let me just put it in a, an Excel spreadsheet, and assume that is the date, and start working it forward and see if it corroborates with anything else. And it really did not. It did not corroborate well with the Ice Age. 
uh, end of the last ice age or with uh, changes we've been seeing. So I, I didn't I didn't get uh, a good hit, a good feel from that. Now Sitchin did the same thing. I think he was about a thousand years off from thirty seven sixty. He 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 was uh, closer to four forty seven hundred BC. He thought it crossed. Well, when I did the math on that one, it it still was, um, you know, two thousand years away or, mm -hmm. or two two hundred years away before it actually would affect us if that was true. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that didn't jive with some of the other evidence that we had that came that we're going to talk a lot about a little bit later. So, hopefully, if somebody had a true orbital table from the past and said definitively here is a crossing that Nibiru came through it, the whole thing would be solved you know you could easily look at the periodicity of the planet even if it's plus or minus some number of years on average it would it would come around about the same time sure sure so um let's get into the hey, enuma let's but talk here's about here's one thing that here's one thing we do know um it's been from our recorded history from, oh, I don't know, uh, since the biblical times, we have not seen the kind of destruction that was assigned to this destroyer planet in Revelations called Wormwood that apparently drug meteors down the earth and all the other destructive things that is described in Revelations that is affiliated with this planet. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen that. So here we've gone you know, 2015 years or so and not seen it. So in the, in the, in the best case, we're not going to see it for another, um, 1,045 years. Best case scenario. In the worst case, it actually transited within that time period previous to the biblical times, about 1500 BCE or so. Now, if that's true, then it's due right now. Okay. So. <laughs> So I did a table uh, in the document to play around with uh, those kind of thoughts to see, you know, w what corroborates here. See the extremes and of the situation. Exactly. So, so, it, so for me, um, finding a fixed point in 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 the past where it transited, um, I'm going to scour this the Sumerian records one more time and see if I can come up with something. But I thought I had one before at 3760 BC, but it doesn't fit. Sure. Gerald, let's go to the Enuma Elish. Let's talk about what we do now. Let's go into the solar system creation account. This is incredibly um, sophisticated and telling about the, the Nibiru planet system. Yeah, when I first read this, it was it was kind of mishmashed to me. It was very long, too, about 11 tablets. And then um, I thought, you know, the only way to make sense of this is to sit down and correlate what their planet names are with our own. And once I did that, and then found out a little bit more about who the players were that were pretending to be these, you know, it started out as this this family relationship that had offspring that became planets that turned into a, a celestial battle. And and some key names showed up in there, by the way. Enki's name, well, he was called EA or Nudamud, he showed up in there. Um, his son, Nikshita, was referred to as Mumu there and was affiliated with the planet Mercury. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the, the, the short story of the Babylonian epic of creation is, it appears that Nibiru and its satellites, moons, uh, maybe even had its own sun, we don't know, um, was in an adjacent galaxy, is what it appears to have happened. Somehow, through the meandering through the galactic center, is my hypothesis, they got dislodged at least their small portion did with their satellites, and it looks like there's up to five planets in the Nibiru constellation. Got dislodged and ended up, according to this allegorical battle in the Enuma Elish, getting trapped into our solar system orbit in a retrograde orbit. Okay, so that's why it came in from the outside of Pluto. Well, <laughs> you know, in their account, they start talking about the different effects that uh, the inner planets in the solar system are going to have relative to their satellites. And they, this is where the battle part comes in, because what if there's a collision? What if this one gets tugged on here and causes this? So mm -hmm. they go through this whole account, very scientific, if you understand now what it is they were talking about, that uh, they did things to the planets in the inner orbit in order to avert collisions including blowing a few things up and uh, redirecting 
or masking the radiance or the radiation from a couple of planets like the sun. Very, very intense, very advanced scientific uh, understanding in this. So anyway, uh, in the first pass through, um, one of their satellites uh, uh, had some problems. There was an existing planet they called Tiamat that sits approximately where the Earth is now. Um, and through the uh, through the uh, um, perihelion transit, um, they describe all these actions they did. The second time through, though, they actually there was a collision with one of their satellites with Tiamut, mm -hmm. and this is what formed the half of it formed the Earth, part of it formed Kingu, the Moon, which is our Moon, and the debris from that formed what they called the Hammered Bracelet, which is our asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So, um, so it's a very detailed account. And, uh, like I said, uh, this was the, this was the document that was read in Babylon every spring under the auspices of Marduk, who was their chief deity, right? And, uh, in that document, he had renamed Nibiru to Marduk mm -hmm. and, and they called it the planet of crossing. Well, so we find out that it's in a retrograde orbit. And that where it crosses the either the solar ecliptic or the point at perihelion was what made it famous as this planet of crossing because apparently it it reshines or re resonates or radiates the radiation from the sun. Uh, it's uh, it's a very large planet uh, according to the the data we're going to get into. It's four times larger than Jupiter. Now think about this. It had to be larger than Jupiter in order to cause Jupiter and Neptune and Uranus to end up with these tilts in their orbit. Mm -hmm. It had to be a very large planet for that to happen. So now, uh, as you'll see, it, it looks to be about 17 times bigger than the Earth and about four times bigger than Jupiter. So with that said, um, its magnetic effect its pull on the Earth would be quite significant if it were it to come within some close proximity. And so that, that could explain a lot of the past pole shifts, the, uh, the change in our magnetic flux that's happening on the Earth now. Mm -hmm. It's been moving significantly. And so something, something is causing that. So I, I, I postulated to you earlier, and I didn't really put this in here, that, you know, we were also told by the Mayans that we'd be you know, going through the galactic center about 20, 2011, 2013, somewhere in there. Okay, some people think it was winter solstice 2012, and uh, Ian Lungold said no, it was October 2011. So that, if that was the case, it could explain adjacent planets warming up. It could potentially explain the gravitational North Pole changing, um, and a lot of the other Earth changes we're seeing. Mm -hmm. At the same time, at the same time, if my theory, my hypothesis was true in the first place, that the the great year, this passage through the galactic center could be the, the disturbance force that caused Nibiru's constellation to get caught up in our solar system in the first place. Well, if that is the case, then those two events would be correlated. So, so this Mayan prediction and that and Nibiru's return could be correlated because of that reason. Sure. Yeah. We're talking something like, a, uh, when we say a planet, it's most likely something like a, a failed second sun, Gerald. Is it safe to say that? Is that probably the best guess we've got at the moment? It's like a failed second sun, like a, dwar a red dwarf or brown dwarf well, that's got it's, satellite it's planets. A, use whatever term you want. Its effect on light is what's important because of its ability to be observed. And according to uh, Dr. Harrington and Dr. Neugebauer, who was from uh, JPL, and this is in the 19, 1980, early 81 or so. Um, they were discussing, uh, the infrared satellite, um, settings that would be needed to detect this planet. And they said something very telling. They said, uh, <clears throat> that the planet is so cold that they had to, unless you had an instrument that could be cooled to minus four, uh, 20 degrees above minus 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. That you would not be able to detect it. So you've got to super cool your in, your instrument in order to detect this thing because it's not reflecting light. It's in the infrared. Okay, so so is that a failed star? I don't know. It could still have 
it could still have magma inside it, you know, but uh, the surface of the planet is very cold. Sure. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Uh, Giorgio de Santiano in Hamlet's Mill talks about Neugebauer's um, uh, data as well. Um, you know, he gets into a lot of the astronomical stuff as well. Um, there is no doubt, though, that the amount of context we have for this Nibiru in historical text, though, Gerald, and I want to focus a little bit on this. This is okay. very important. We can do some of the science and, and, and the astronomy right. in a bit. But, uh, I mean, the, the amount of times we have this uh, Nibiru planet mentioned, uh, for either Nibiru or Marduk, um, no, it, the way that you describe it, there is nothing else that can fit this other than a planet, Gerald. I mean, it, it's not a star because a star just doesn't do what this thing is supposed to do. Yes, it does reflect a lot of light because of the nature of its, of what it is and how it comes into our solar system. But um, there's only one thing that fits this, and that's like a, a, a planet with a very long oval trajectory. Is that correct? Yeah, well, you go all the way back to the late 1700s. Uh, there were uh, the first people that were using telescopes uh, that were searching for whatever. They, they hadn't even found Pluto yet, okay? They, we didn't find Pluto until the 1930s. These guys were focused on what is disturbing the outer planets. A real physical, tangible question. What's dis what, what is so large that disturbed them off of the solar ecliptic? They wanted to know, and it's still a valid question today. Okay, something tangible that had a interactive effect, either collision or a magnetic or gravitational effect, changed the orbit of these very massive planets. Mm -hmm. And that that has been a search for the astronomical community for a very long time. And it turns out that Tombaugh who was working for, uh, who was he? I think he was with the IRS. I think he was with the IRS program too. Mm -hmm. He, or, or I can't remember where he's from, but he actually got accredited with finding Pluto in the 1930s, but it was by accident. They were actually looking for what this big object was that could have affected our outer giants, planetary giants. Sure. Wow, incredible, Gerald. Gerald, I mean, let's get into Sitchin, in step Sitchin in 76. Uh, he, Brings in this um, incredible tablet, um, this sorry, this um, imprint of a cylinder seal, um, the famous photograph, uh, but it's a photograph of a cylinder seal. It's in the Berlin Museum. It's known as VA two four three. Not a very illustrious name, Gerald, but uh, very VA, controversial. Yeah, uh, VA two four three. Probably the most controversial cylinder seal in existence. You know, I love cylinder seals, Gerald. So uh, I know. I actually. I actually put this in the document because I knew how much you love cylinder seals. <laughs> and I had some fun. I had a little bit of fun with this one. But uh, I like your analysis though, Gerald. I like your analysis. Now I'm going to again refer the audience to the to the, the book or the document, the article that you wrote in the in the YouTube description and then you know get a copy of this because it's got all the pictures, tables, data and the analysis all there. Um very, very similar document, Gerald. But you know I'll be honest, I mean, I just looked at this as just a pure picture, and it's only when I see the analysis that you've done, Gerald, with the relative sizes of the, and, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of criticism of this, but the criticism, Gerald, uh, that you have seems to have dispelled here for me, uh, I mean, it's great because it's, it, it seems like a no-brainer. This, it's showing relative sizes, Gerald, and, uh, it's, it looks like it is actually, uh, you know, um, Nibiru in the center. I mean, it doesn't look like it's a star, you know, or a sun. Or it's a star. Yeah, well, so I'll give a little background. So um, this very controversial uh, cylinder seal, and, and I know I know how difficult it must have been to etch this thing on stone and roll this thing out now that you look at the detail. And uh, anyway, um, in between two of the beings on the top left, it looks like... Um, a primitive worker is being led by the hand and introduced to an Anunnaki deity that's seated with the plow. And I'll have to go and decode uh, the cuneiform that's on there. It's not hard. We have a cuneiform script and a dictionary now, so anybody can do it. And I'll look at see, see what some of the words say on here. But uh, just looking at it from the historical record, um, it was interesting to me because, number one, it shows a circle with... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven star or seven points around it. Okay. And the Anunnaki oftentimes used uh, uh, a star symbol to refer, represent different planets. Mm -hmm. So a five, a five uh, 
seven-pointed star, refer to the Earth, the six-pointed, Mars. And, and from there, Enuma Elish, that we assign numbers to the planets based on working from the outside in, from Pluto inward, and then theirs ending up as the, as the 12th planet because they were the last ones in. So that's how we ended up calling the Earth the seventh planet. All right? Sure. <laughs> so anyway, so this, this cylinder seal that Titchen was so um, focused on had... Uh, in between this primitive worker and this uh, liaison that was going to introduce him to his enslaved role as a farmer working with the plow, right in between them was uh, this star-looking symbol, a very large circular uh, dot in between, and then um, several other dots around them that were looked like planets around an orbit, okay, around a sun, around a central sun, you know, just like our solar system. And so... Uh, it turns out that Sitchin was very excited about that because there weren't just nine planets, there were ten. So he believed that they were talking about an additional planet in our solar system that we hadn't accounted for, even in the 1930s when we found Pluto. Okay? Mm. So on the cylinder seal, it became controversial as, as to using it as a source whether there was another planet out there or not. Okay? So he wrote about this in the 12th planet. Um, this controversy, uh, I don't know, kind of came to a head uh, even more so after his death. But basically, what do, what can we take this these dots or these circles and this central sun-looking uh, picture to mean? Uh, could it be representational of a chronology in time when the plow was given to mankind? So it's commemorating some uh, ephemeris. If you were to look at those as, well, are these the planets and the and the zodiacal houses are in at the time? Is this a is this a time marker to commemorate this event? Or is it a indication of where the Earth was at the time when the event, just the Earth itself, because it's got a sun with seven points on it. Mm -hmm. So that means it's uh it's pretty specific to the radiation that's hitting the seventh planet to me. Not that it's the seventh planet. Okay, because it's shown much larger than the other sphere. So all of a sudden you go, well, why are the why are the sphere the circles different sizes? Mm -hmm. And all so so this kind of led to a lot of questions, and um, a lot of people have attacked uh, the theory of Nibiru even existing just simply based on this single piece of evidence, which I think is absurd. But some people have done it. Okay, so uh, okay. I decided to I don't know take another look at this and see if there's anything else we could glean from. Uh, what they were saying on this seal. See, you know, is that now there's a, there's a historical story that came from some of Sitchin's writings and others that even in the Cain and Abel story from the Sumerians, we had Anunnaki siblings from the Enkiite and Enlilite clan interacting with them. For instance, uh, according to the story, um, Abel, the son of, uh, of Adam, you know, there was Cain and Abel. Well, uh, Abel was taught to do farming by Ninurta, which was which was uh, Enlil's son. The warrior Ninurta was also known as Apollo. Well, the Cain portion, the Cain, the Cain offspring was taught herdsmanship and and cattle management by none other than Marduk. And then you have the biblical story of uh, uh, Cain and Abel and Cain killing Abel with a stone because he didn't receive the same praise from Enki that uh Ab that uh Cain did for meat production okay mm -hmm. so it was kind of a very crazy story and a very crazy tie in with the Anunnaki so so i thought well let's let's look at these orbs on here and see if you know, knowing knowing that you studied cylinder seals and they are very precise i mean just crazy precise how how they could even do this in the first place so would they have haphazardly drawn these on here? And is, you know, can it tell us anything? So I started looking into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I glommed on to someone else's research who had, and this is shown in figure three, VA 243 uh, planet numbering, basically starting from the smallest circle on that blown up picture from VA 243 and assigning numbers to it. Um, 
you you could you'll end up with uh, one through twelve. Okay. Sure. And the smallest one probably being Pluto, since we know it's the smallest planet, and then the largest one being the Sun. Okay, which turns out to be right in the sky. and all the other planets. All the other planets orbit the Sun anyway, so it kind of makes sense to make that assumption, no matter whether there's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points on this central Sun, which is uh, look making it look like a star, which is interesting. Okay, mm-hmm. so numbering them that way. And then putting them into a table, uh, and then going to the uh, detail log from the ephemeris and looking up their actual diameters in kilometers. Um, that's what is shown in Figure Four. Okay. Now somebody took it upon themselves to take this picture and blow it up, and then actually measure the pixel sizes across each of these spheres, these cir- these two-dimensional circles representing spheres. And then put them in a table as well and see if they correlated with uh, the actual diameters in kilometers of our planets. Of course, now think about this problem. you got a huge constellation of uh, or our solar system that you're trying to represent in a very small space. How do you do that? How do you do that such that the planets even show up? Because if that was the case and you had to show the sun and actually show Pluto on there, you maybe you'll get the sun, but then you wouldn't get a, many of the other planets because they're so small. You'd have to show them like little tiny dots. You don't, understand what I'm don't saying? Don't they have this so problem? There's, scaling, there's a scaling problem. Yeah, okay? Don't they have this problem Total printing scale. printing astronomy books as well, Gerald? They they represent the they represent the the solar system in a different scale than the, to what it actually is, so that they can actually make it more uh, uh, easy to interpret for the reader or the viewer. Yeah, it's like a it's like a geometrical transform. Yeah, is what you're doing. Okay, so that you can spatially still show them correctly, even though uh, you have to go through the transform to make them show back up the way they should be. Understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I so I went through some of this research and I thought, okay, well let me let me uh, follow this through. So the basic idea is to find and see if the size of the the circles on VA243 have any correlation whatsoever to the actual planet sizes in our constellation so that you could say these are stars or these are planets or just what, right? Mm-hmm. Let's use math. So in doing that, um, I'm going to skip forward to what I call figure six, where I decided to play a couple of games because in order for them to make those planets show up, in any kind of uh, geometric transform, they would have had to use a logarithmic scale. There's no way you could use a linear scale and get them to, in that small space. And it is not so much the space, space as it is their size relative to each other so that you could still see them all. You with me? Yeah. Sure. And have them log, still be scalable. Log scaling is something we exactly. use so, all the time. Generally. So I went through a logarithmic scaling to look at the two different the actual diameter in kilometers and the actual diameter in pixels. Okay. And of course the pixel size is very different relative to something in kilometers. So, so what you do with something like that is you look for um, a way to do a transform and see if there's a correlation for every point using the same transform, not a different transform. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you can go back and forth between data sets. Well, that's what I did. So I decided to use a little Anunnaki trick and use a kind of a sexagesimal logarithmic, not a base 10, and take the the log base 66 of the diameter of the actual planets and then compare that with the log base 6 of the, of the smaller representation of the pixels that had to be placed on the cylinder seal. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Well, when I did that, well, first of all, I just took the pixel diameter and see if it, to see if it correlated with the, the diameter of the planets uh, from Pluto all the way to the sun. Okay? In, And they're ordered in that order from smallest to largest. Okay. So when I did that, I ended up with a correlation of 89.98%. Not very good. Okay. It's, it's okay. It's better than average, but still it's not enough to convince me that, okay, those dots, excuse me, on the cylinder seal correspond to the actual planets in our system. But when you compare the, log base 66 of the diameter that in kilometers with the log base 6 of the pixel size you get a 99.503% correlation so what i'm telling you is those dots 
were not arbitrarily sized on VA243. They were intentionally scaled logarithm logarithmically to represent all the planets that are in our solar system. You couldn't including ask for theirs, accuracy, Including theirs, including theirs. You, you really couldn't ask for accuracy that good. I mean, you couldn't. To get a 99.5% accuracy correlation is, is beautiful. It's almost exact. It's actually within, uh, you know, uh, scientific uh, measurements, like, you know, to, to allow a plus or minus 5.5%. <laughs> well, whoever was chiseling that, that little seal, they probably got to that point and they said, that's probably good enough for the girls we run around with. <laughs> I don't know, but for sure. it's very. Now, the other thing that brings up is if they spent that much time making sure the sizes corresponded to each other relative to actual planet size. Like I said, the other next analysis is do the or do the locations now map to zodiacal houses in the ecliptic that correspond to a time in the past history that this event occurred? That makes sense to me. Why else would you put it there? Sure. So, so anyway, it turned out to be, uh, I don't know, I think it turned out to be a victory for Sitchin and a loss for his critics. Because the reality is, uh, what he said about it is it does represent our solar system and it does include a 10th planet, which they, in their documents, call it Marduk from the old Babylonian version, and they call it Nibiru in that Hamlet Mill document, and other Akkadian documents as well, but I've been trying to find a, a good one that I could use, and I couldn't find a good reference. So I was happy to see that from the Hamlet Mill, that over and over and over again, everywhere where Marduk's name had replaced the, the planetary name, it was Nibiru. Incredible. You know, this is... a. Uh... This is the, the the relative sizes and the and the distances, Gerald. They're just uh, the proportions. It's all and the positions. It, it's all beautiful. It's all beautiful. The, the more the more I look at it now with the analysis that you done, Gerald, the more it makes sense to me. It, it's clearly. Well, I figured. I figured if anybody got it, you would, being an expert on cylinder seals. Yeah. So I thought, you know, who better to share this thought with than you? Here's the thing, Gerald. Here's the thing. If you drew, if that picture wasn't on a cylinder seal, if that picture drawing a representation of the solar system that we're purporting, right? If that was done on a piece of paper, you could say that they put that randomly there somewhere. But to get it onto a cylinder seal that accurate, I mean, they knew exactly what they're doing. That wasn't by chance, Gerald. Not on the cylinder seal. You could say no. that, you could say that on a flat piece of paper or something, you know, not on, not on that something that accurate, that position. Well, it, I mean, it's, you know, and it's not, a, it's not huge in the first place. I mean, just think about the pre precision that had to go into that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I could talk cylinder seals all day, you know, and, I, and I'll point I know you can, and I was never, I was never, um, that, I don't know, drawn to them, but the more I see what the, the, the absolute technology and precision they put into those things i mean it, it just blows you away mm. just for the listeners i showed Ger gerald a picture of a cylinder seal from the british museum last uh during the week there made out of rock crystal nine out of ten on the moss scale showing uh the anatomy of animals sitting down with their legs bent and you can see the muscles on the legs and how they bend their legs and to draw any anatomy whether it's human or animal anatomy is incredibly hard to do in artistic expression and especially hard to do in three dimensions are embossing it into a re reverse embossing it into a, cr a piece of crystal i mean you need to cut that thing with diamond or crystal you know it's incredibly sophisticated accuracy down to millimeters of depth uh to, to so that it's imprinted into uh clay when it's uh, rolled out like it's these guys could do it gerald i mean you, you see the example well, it's impressive that not only did they do it in a reverse imprint so you had to put ditches where the mounds were going to show up but they did it in reverse mm. i mean that's like <laughs> that's incredibly difficult sophisticated yeah yeah you, know, you know va243 I'll, I'll let the listeners uh look that up in, in google images you'll see the the famed picture and uh you know the analysis of this gerald now uh, from what i've seen in your document um uh, you know, it, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see that. It's, it's it gives us a good foundation. Um, you know, Nibiru is real. Um, Nibiru is there, and it's and it's done to scale as well. Um, you know, I just want to mention John Matisse and, and Daniel Whitmire. I mean, these guys have suggested in '99 that there was a a planet X type body in the Oort cloud. And you know, what a bit that gets me, Gerald, is that these guys 
mention this thing as if it's something totally new. <laughs> it's just this new idea, you know? These guys, being astronomers, must be aware of Stitchin's work. They must be aware of the existing Planet X mystery, the existing Nibiru uh, um, case that's out there in the public domain. Of course, every astronomer out there is aware of this. They may not talk about it to me, but to come up with a Planet X as if it's just a new idea. Um, but again, they've recently said that it's out there and it's a, it's a failed second sun and, um, it's like people, I don't even know whether this stuff is disinformation or is it to take the eyes off the real, uh, planet X Nibiru. But, um, what, what's your thoughts on that, Gerald? They, they, it's, it's, it's pretty sure that there's something else, there's something else, uh, tugging on, on the planet's life. We, we know that. Yeah, I, I, re- I remember seeing their their research, and it actually ended up on a documentary, I believe, in about 1999. And it was a retelling of the same stuff that had gone on with uh, Sitchin and Harrington prior. But maybe because of the political environment, they were trying to rediscover it, uh, reintroduce it under some other name, perhaps, or other venues, so that it was so that it was disambiguated from the past. I don't know what their motivation was to pretend like it had never been discussed before. Yeah, uh, they, I mean, they may have had a, they may have, you know, maybe they had to do that for funding reasons. I don't know. Yeah, I just got a good point there. Maybe they did it for funding reasons, but, um, you know, I mean, there may be large icy bodies out there, but I don't think the fail second sun's out there in the Oort cloud. I think, yeah, it, it's, um, I definitely think there's something tugging on the planets. We mathematically know it. We mathematically, I just for the listeners uh, that are new to the Nibiru uh, scenario, it's mathematically known that there's something tugging on the outer planets. Um, there's something there, and it's and it's not Pluto because Pluto hasn't got the mass to do it. We know that. We know that mathematically. Well, That's how they find these planets. They mathematically yeah. know. Well, not only was it tugging on them, but it tugged on them so hard that they're displaced in their orbit. That's a point I want to re-emphasize. Okay, so they it got they got tugged on so hard, at least at one point, where their or, their orbits are changed and they've never gone back. Okay, so this is this is a significant issue. Mm. It's like you know, and I'm sure we're going to get to it in just a minute when we talk about that. But it's not it's not just a tugging. Okay, it's it's a real physical planar change. It's dislodging them. It's totally dislodging them. Yes. Wow. Now, and I'll reiterate, whatever it is, it couldn't have been Pluto because it had to be so large to dis- dislodge a planet that had to be smaller than it was. Okay, so whatever it came through it had to be larger than <laughs> than Neptune and Uranus in order to have that happen. That means it's very large. I mean, Neptune and Uranus are big planets. I mean, this thing. Yes, is- they are. Yes, they are. You're gonna if you're gonna dislodge them, you're you got a seriously big body out there, John. Yeah, just from a sizing standpoint, just real quick. Uh, the sun is 1,392,684 kilometers in diameter. Um, Nibiru is shown at 226,973. And Jupiter, the next biggest planet, is at 142,984. So Nibiru is bigger than Jupiter, and it's bigger than Saturn that's sitting at 120,536. Okay, so basically Nibiru is... Looks like about 17 times bigger than the Earth, and it's more than two times bigger than Jupiter. Actually, it looks like almost three times bigger than Jupiter. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's a it's a bit it's a big planet. I mean, it, it, people aren't living on Nibiru. It's it's probably the satellite moons that they're living on, though, Gerald. Is that correct? Um, prob- probably. Actually, they're probably on various planets throughout the solar system and other galaxies, uh, doing the same thing, gathering resources and occupying the place just like they did the planet Earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Harrington. This is, this is for me where the astronomy comes in now, Gerald. Um, there's a, there's original analysis done by Harrington. We might, we might even be able to expand on that later in the show, but, Let's talk about what we know about Harrington first, the Harrington background, and of course the, okay. the, fa- the famous IRAS satellite. Okay, well, I, I, I'll try to do this from memory. I, I have his video on my website where he met with Zechariah Sitchin in August of 1991, I believe it was. I'll have to look at, let, let me look up, let me look just real quick and see if that's the date. August 30th, 1990. Um, Harrington met with Sitchin 
Washington, D.C. Now, he's the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory. Okay, he's a, he's a big, he's a top dude, okay? <laughs> so here, apparently, according to him in, in this video, he says about 1978 time frame, um, and Sitchin wrote his book, 12th Planet, 1976, and somehow Harrington got a copy of it and, and had read the Enuma Elish closely, understanding that it appears in their celestial battle account that there was an intruder planet at the edge of our solar system and in his mind he was aha that's what disturbed neptune uranus and blah 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 right the hidden the hidden mystery planet that was large enough that could do this this is what he was looking for just like all these guys were okay mm -hmm. so um this was about 1978 time frame now he says after about after meeting with sitchin looking at his orbital chart they basically conferred, nodded, and said, yeah, that's the same planet that you've talked about in your 12th planet that we're looking for. And and instead of where you've got your orbital diagram drawn in these zodiacal houses, if you take into account the procession that's happened since uh, biblical times, it would be right here. And he, and he showed him a diagram, and I put that in the document, okay? Now, I didn't think much about that document, and... And I'll tell you a little bit more about what I did with it in just a second. So um, Harrington took some action based on this information that he corroborated with Sitchin. And he said six months after um, um, he had uh, gotten this information in his head, they he had actually commissioned um, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and then Pine 10 and 11. So Pioneer 10, if you see this diagram that he showed in his orbital chart when they were discussing, Pioneer 10 was positioned at the perihelion point to see any planet that came in around the sun on the backside where the Earth might be shielded from it, or couldn't see it because of the brightness of the sun. Um, Pioneer 11 was placed at the location that um, Harrington believed uh, Nibiru would be coming in in its retrograde orbit from the south. And he split the uh, orbital pattern with Pioneer 11. So it was looking in a way where it could see it coming or going. But with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, he put those at the um, aphelion and perihelion in, inbound and outbound locations exactly on the zodiacal house, one looking out and one looking in. So it's very, very telling about where they were putting these instruments and what they were looking for. Okay, and this shows up on the diagram, and I think that's so interesting. So, um, what else could we tell from uh, this interaction with these two? Well, according to the diagram, Harrington had shown the location of Nibiru, and so had Sitchin, and they'd just drawn a circle on this on this orbital chart. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they had not used the logarithmic scaling like the Anunnaki had done on their cylinder seal. And instead of drawing the planets in their orbits around the sun on this chart, they had just drawn circle, uh, circu circular, spherical, two-dimensional paths around it to indicate where the planet would be, but not the size of the planet so you could do a comparison. Sure. Okay? Sure. So I was going to play that same trick with their diagram as we did with the cylinder seal, but I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the only planet they showed in a circle in two dimensions was Nibiru. And it was shown just outside of Pluto. Okay? Just outside it. Not a huge distance away. So I thought, well, um, I wonder if that's the scale. And I'll, I'll show you what I did with that in a little while. Anyway, um, so let's go forward with Harrington's story just a little bit farther. So this was circa 19... 78, they send their probes out, blah, blah, blah. And he didn't meet with um, Sitchin until 1990, which I found very interesting. Several years. years after he'd read his book. Yeah. Yeah. So here it is, 1990, the guy's the supervising astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory, and he's making a video with an alternative uh, cosmogony guy like Sitchin. Uh, and... Somehow the government's allowing it. I don't, I don't understand that. <laughs> but that's crazy. Think about that happening now. Right? It's incredible that they're using Pioneer and Voyager and the ERA satellite, Gerald, to look for this Planet X. And, you know, still, still, the silence from NASA. 
Science. Yeah, yeah. So I in my figure nine in this document, I showed the uh, viewing range or the, uh, the the field of view for Pioneer Eleven and Voyager Two, and it doesn't show um, Pioneer Ten, Voyager One because it's it's a little bit out of the scene. But you can see on that particular one, he's in Sagittarius and Scorpio, which is exactly if you look. Uh, uh, actually, this was the prediction from Bill uh, Broussard was was Sagittarius and Scorpio, where those two ended up. Mm -hmm. He had Voyager 2 on the uh, outbound path for Nibiru, according to Sitchin's chart, which turned out to be close enough to the inbound path <laughs> for Broussard's or the next procession of the equinox into a zodiacal house from biblical times, about 2,000 years, so that he could hedge his bet. So basically, they hedged their bet on whether it was in the next zodiacal house or the one after it and how they place their probes. So you can clearly see Harrington's hand here, just as he said, in going out and taking definitive action to find this thing. Well, so, yeah, so, it, so what did, so what do so we know? <laughs> in 1981, the first um, article came out. Are we are we ready to talk about that? Or actually, well, let's talk a little bit more about Harrington. No, no, no let's do this, and then we'll go back to Harrington because in 1991 was the next big event. So 1981, um, the first article showed up in the newspaper talking about this tenth planet, and this was in the D Detroit News, January 16th, 1981. Sure. Now. So it, it says, uh, 10th planet, Pluto orbit says yes. Okay. Well, it wasn't just Pluto's orbit, but it was Neptune. It was, uh, the big planets as well. Yeah. So, uh, I tried to read this article, but I couldn't find a legible version of it online. Are you with me? Yeah. I must still be in, uh, like the libraries and the, the, the archives there. Oh, sure. Sure. So anyway, uh, I did find another art. There were several other articles that came out. Um, in the same in the same year, so uh, there was another one that came out in the New York Times, January thirtieth, nineteen eighty one, where they're talking about Harrington uh, and Planet X. And in this one, there was a uh, there was something that was legible that I could see that I kind of focused in on. And then the Washington Post one with Thomas O'Toole was was even better, and it came out two years later, nineteen eighty three. Well, anyway, in nineteen eighty one, the New York Times, Harrington states that he thinks Planet X is five billion miles outside of Pluto's orbit. And that must be at the time that he was looking. So 1981. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, we know that Pluto's distance uh, is about 3.6 billion years from the sun. So, you know, you're talking about, if you add those together, that's about 8.67 billion years uh, at that point away from the sun at, at that point in 1981. That's what he's saying. So then all of a sudden you get excited as an engineer and go, oh, distance equals rate times time. Maybe I could figure out how, you know, how fast it was traveling. When's it going to be here? That's, that's what everybody wants to know, right? Yeah, at least anyway, we've got some so data. I, that, so like... so that, that stuck in my mind, though, that he had assigned a distance to it. That means uh, from this IRS data that they gathered, he thought it was 5 billion miles. Okay, now in this next article of the Washington Post, uh, by Thomas O'Toole, uh, the, the next major character shows up that I think is very important to this story. And his name's Dr. Jerry uh, Neubauer. And he was the IRAS chief scientist for California's J Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he was the director of the Palomar Observatory for uh, Caltech, where my kid's uh, in college there, okay? So mm -hmm. he's an important dude. He's got his fingers on the data from the IRAS satellite, the one that had to be super cooled, right, to detect this thing. So he shows up in this article, and he's almost like he's in disagreement with Harrington. And it's it's interesting because he, he says he thinks it's 50 billion miles away, not 5 billion outside of Pluto. Okay, so there's contradiction number one, okay? And additionally... Um, he stated that uh, he he was trying to douse any fears by saying that uh, it's not inbound. Okay, but at the same time, uh, one of the other scientists said that if it's if it even if it's fifty billion miles of that close to the Earth, then it's part of our solar system. Is what he was saying. Sure. 
So uh, this was uh, a guy named James Hauk from Cornell University. Okay, so you know these are these are these are uh, serious scientists talking about this. They, these are, this is this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is just pure scientific data from the IRS satellite in 1981. Okay. Uh, now what's interesting is uh, they were clever enough to say, well, is it moving or not? So in order to do that, you've got to take two measurements. And they, they call it the blink method, right? You mm -hmm. take one and wait some period of known time and take another one and then come up with the delta x and you can, and the delta time and you can come up with the, uh, the speed, change in x over change in time. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so, and, and apparently, um, Harrington waited six months after his first measurement to take a picture of this from the IRS. Okay. So they had a really good blink. Okay, and yep. this is where Neugebauer comes up and says it's 50 billion miles away, um, <clears throat> and uh, and talks about all the super cooling they had to do to get the picture, and then he says something very uh, significant. Uh, he says it's not in it's not incoming. Neugebauer said, "I want to douse that idea with as much cold water as I can." Now, why would he say such a thing if they had just taken the blink method of it, but didn't discuss anything about the data? That's very curious to me. It's murky. It's very, very murky to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what role this guy was playing. He almost seems to have been playing a little bit of a disinformation role. Whoever this guy was, it was put in a position to have access to this data directly from the IRS scope. OK, but the bottom line is none of them disagreed that they had found something very large. Uh, what what appears to be in disagreement is how far away it was and and whether it was moving. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that got left out of the article. But um, the next link I found as I was starting to look at articles, there were I had no idea how many articles have been published on Planet X and Nibiru. By the way, I gave you a link on this in, uh, in this section. It's on page 25. Sure. It goes all the way back to the 50s, and there are hundreds of articles, <laughs> not just five or six. There are hundreds of articles. I got through a couple, Gerald. I got through a couple. There's so many. I mean, it's, it's mind There's so many. So, so the idea that there's something tangible at the end of the universe that's disturbing big planets is so physical and believable to people that it's been a focal point for investigation for a very long time. Okay. It's not new. Okay. So I wanted to finish up with that. Now, what, so we, we got to 1981. There were several more articles almost every year you see in that link that I gave you, uh, oh, yeah. talking about Planet X updates. Uh, well, it turned out there was some real, um, disinformation going on in the year 1991. But it turns out that was the year also, right after um, Harrington had done this interview with Sitchin, apparently he went off to this place in New Zealand that we we looked up. Do you remember where that was in New Zealand? Uh, Birch, uh, Black Birch, I think it was. Right. So he took an 8-inch telescope there on his own to go see if he could actually get uh, personal images using the blink method, <laughs> like we were describing here, two different measurements at different times. And then seeing if it had moved and how fast it was moving. Well, let, let, let's, let's think about that for just a second. Number one, he was so convinced by the IRS data that this thing is inbound and that it's within the distance that he could see it from the southern hemisphere or looking from New Zealand south. He believed it was in the constellation Libra coming in near Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the, in the diagram, I showed uh, Google Earth where that was. Okay, so it, it coincides with this southern path that Harrington believed in as well, uh, but he added his processional uh, updates to make it more accurate. And, and Sitchin did not disagree with him, by the way, when mm -hmm. he said that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here he is in New Zealand, and I don't have the article in front of me, but he went there to get data, and he was due back to release this data at a conference in the United States when he came back. Well, apparently he never came back and died of suddenly of throat cancer there in New Zealand with his eight inch scope. Now think about that. The, the just 
audacity of a cancer killing somebody that quickly be getting on an airplane going over there not just not talking about you know being a victim of cancer and all of a sudden just dying from it within a short period i just don't buy it i don't buy it so it, very 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 significant red flags in the demise of Harrington and what he was doing relative to this planet that had been discovered. Mm -hmm. Listen, he was, he was the chief, he was the supervising astronomer. He came back with his personal data that probably got absconded with through whatever forces were controlling the IRS data directly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, it looks like he was headed off the path and he was not allowed to share that. But what I want you to take away from that is if he was able to take an eight inch scope and potentially see it um, inbound to uh, the point where it goes into perihelion with the sun, where it basically goes behind the sun, you can't see it. If he was able, in his belief that he could go someplace and look south and see this for some period of time, and apparently this was one of the few places on the planet, according to him, based on the thickness of the atmosphere and several other issues that he could actually see it. Um, so that's very telling um, what, what, <laughs> what he was up to. Now, um, that, uh, I don't even know what to say. What, what are your thoughts about uh, it's the incredible. fact that he was, I mean, this would... if he was able to see it, that means it was probably within the, um, it, the, the, not the inner planets, but at least on the inside of Pluto, the, such that he could see it. I mean, just think about an eight-inch scope; its range of limitation. I mean, the guy was about to, to give the biggest discovery of our century, if not our millennium, Gerald, to, to you know to the public. He was about to release like tangible evidence. Um, of this, he went looking for it and he got it, and he was in the place and the own location on the planet to do that. Um, fast acting cancer killed him. Um, and look what happened to the Nibiru Planet X uh, hypothesis after that. It, it fell. Oh, into, I know. Oh, it it exactly. basically disappeared. And if you look at the uh, list of articles going back to the 50s, Gerald, go to the 30th of November 91, where science say goodbye to the 10th planet. There is no 10th exactly. planet. Exactly. Yeah, so right after Harrington died, all of a sudden you saw in the media this smear campaign yes. to make Nibiru go away. It was very, very telling. And you can only see these kind of things in retrospect. Yeah. I mean, and they, and they did a good job. They buried the story of Nibiru. Uh, only for it to resurface as just this thing in, her, in the art cloud. And it's like, um, you know, it's not Nibiru. It's a planet X again. It's not, it's, this Nibiru seems to be this... Uh, disengaged from Planet X. This Planet X is supposed to be a new astronomical scientific uh, hypothesis, and the word Nibiru is like this dirty word associated exactly. with Exactly. Exactly. You know, you, it's it's like exactly what they did with UFOs. If you used to talk about a UFO, you were you know you were made to be shameful because you must be losing your faculties, right? Well, it's the same thing that they're doing with Nibiru. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, make no mistake, this Nibiru isn't going away, Gerald. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly uh, interesting because there's something there. There's something tangible. There's a lot of scientific data, a lot of historical data. Um, you know, and Harrington's analysis really, you know, the fact that they buried that, um, for so long, that's, that's one thing, but it, it's, it's not gone forever, Gerald. I mean, there's too many people on the case uh, now. No, it's not. So, um, do you want to take a break and then come back and do some let's take data a break, analysis? Because, yeah, let's take a break because we want to get into, uh, you know, where this leads us now. I mean, we'll, we'll come back after the break and we'll get into where, where we're at with it now today. And uh, we'll take it, you know, what's happened since uh, Harrington's time. Uh, what can we exactly. do? What can we tell? And what can we find out? And is there like uh, any prediction or is there any safe zone we can sign and say? I mean, at the end of the day, if this thing is incoming, Gerald, we're going to want to know about it. I mean, it'll probably wipe out half the planet if it comes in close. It might come and, you know, have a, a safe passing, Gerald, you know, but if, if there's anything we can know about it, even predict a, a, a kind of window of opportunity when this thing's going to appear. Or if there's anything right. we can know, we'll try and we'll try and guesstimate. We'll do a guesstimate or a best guess, 
Uh, but we'll come back on the break uh, and we'll get into what happened since Harrington's time. Okay, sounds great. Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and you can catch uh, everything I'm doing on the Capricorn members page or capricornradio.com will take you to the free one hour uh, shows as well. Uh, but Of course, become a member, you can catch the shows as they are released in the member section. Uh, of course, you're going to listen to today's author uh, at GeraldClark77.com and read all about him there. And we are talking today about Nibiru. And for those that didn't pick up before the break, uh, Gerald had to prompt me to go to break because I got so excited talking about Nibiru. But uh, are you back with me, Gerald? Yeah, brother, I'm back with you. Hey, I got so excited talking about it. I forgot to go to break, Gerald. I was, I was, just, I was in Planet Nibiru land there. I was like, I'm just so enthralled in what we're talking about, Gerald. Uh, it's incredibly exciting um, to get down to some kind of, to synthesize the data and to get to some, uh, to get to the heart of uh, what's going on. I definitely think, Gerald, there's a lot of disinformation out there. I mean, there's, there's a minefield of disinformation. And there's, a pe- there's people out there very hungry to know what on earth is going on with this because Number one, is it real? Number two, is it coming our way? It's, it's two simple questions, Gerald. Very, very, exactly. si- very simple questions. They're very realistic questions. Very uh, pertinent questions. Um, you know, is it real? Is it coming our way? It's, it's this. It's one question follows the other. Um, I don't want to be a prediction machine either, Gerald, and I don't want to do what the others are doing out there. But I do want to do today's show for the purpose of trying to find out some answers and there's going to be one we can I think we can speculate and we can put a window there I guess at best uh, I think it's safe to do that um, but yeah I mean where are we at since Harrington's day I mean things start to really go uh, by the wayside in the research uh, I mean they really did hit a curveball at, at Nibiru research there with that one girl and they just you know they seem to smash all any serious research uh, it's, it's taken a long time to get back on track well, it seems like a couple of things. Number one, there's been a stake, excuse me. Number one, there's been a stake put in the ground by two doctors, Dr. Harrington and Dr. Neugebauer, both significant characters who were at the forefront with their hands on the money, on the instruments, looking out in space. Okay. So I, I really want to defer to that and focus on the data that they gave out so that we could go forward. Now, before we get too much farther past Harrington and all this disinformation campaign, from the point where he met with Sitchin in August 30th of 1990, mm-hmm. uh, he showed an orbital map that caused me to think to myself, would he be carrying a map around that was not to scale? Because he had specifically drawn, drawn Nibiru just outside of Pluto at that time. Okay, mm-hmm. so how so the distance outside of these orbital lines that he had drawn for these other planets was that significant? Did he do it based on a scale? You know, so we started with the the uh, cylinder seal VA two forty three, found out that was scaled, log, log which scaling. scientifically is very hard to refute. Okay, mm-hmm. and I hope Sitchin sits up in his grave and salutes us for doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, uh, for sure, so, for sure, so yeah. this is, so, so we're talking about a real stake in the ground circa 1978 when they first commissioned these probes to go look at it all the way up to 1991, 1990. He's meeting with Sitch and saying, yeah, now from that chart that he gave us in 1990, we have to assume that the observation that he had for Nibiru was at that location at that time. Now, to be fair, in 1981, when that Detroit article came out, and then the Tombaugh article in the New York Times in 1983, uh, Neugebauer said it was 50 billion miles away, whereas Herring said it was only 5 billion miles beyond Pluto. Well, depending on how fast it was moving, from 1981 to 1990, when he met with Sitchin, if it was moving, it could have already been parallel with or inside of Pluto by that point, is the point I'm making. Okay, mm-hmm. so then it, then it brings up to their question. Well, we know it's eighteen hundred miles, or eighteen yeah, eighteen eighteen hundred years straight line out if it takes a thirty six hundred year orbit. If you believe all the records that say a SAR, which the Sumerian kings list were written in, SARS, which was a thirty six hundred year period. 
So if you believe that to be true, take half of that. That's how far out it takes to go in and then go back out, right? So then using uh, distance equals rate times time, you can figure that out. But before we do that, let's go back to Harrington's scaling on his map. So, <clears throat> so what I did is I took his map with the orbital plane lines that are shown for our, our known nine planets, and then the spot he had drawn as a circle for Nibiru at some distance outside of Pluto's orbit, okay? So I said, well, is it to scale? And I wanted to know this, because if he had drawn it where he believed it was to scale, then all of a sudden we would have a point in time to know exactly where it was, right? Okay. And this is the whole question, is who's got... We know the data's out there, Somebody's got it in their hands that are that's looking at either Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1 or 2. Whoever's looking at that data, they have the answers, okay? And that's so everyone else in my opinion is speculating. Only those people have it. And and it looks like it went from JPL/United States Naval Observatory handling of this matter over to NASA. Did you notice that? So everything now comes through NASA. Uh, whereas before, it was through these rogue scientists that were actually open and discussing and were probably honorable. Mm -hmm. At least one. At least Harrington was. At least Harrington, tell. anyway. Okay, so I, I I measured the distance from the sun to Pluto, the sun to Nibiru, took those linear distances and assumed that they were to a scale, and then solved for the uh, the rate, distance equals rate times time for Nibiru, and then tried to calculate or actually, I saw for the distance first to see if what the distance was corresponded with what Harrington believed. And it turns out, in that calculation, Nibiru was 6.66 billion miles away from the sun. Uh, if his if his orbital chart was to scale. Now, remember, he said it was just outside of Pluto, and he thought it was 5 billion miles away in 1981, in the first or, or 1983. Actually, he said it in 81. It showed up in 83. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it's moving, it's move, it's, and it's, and it's inbound toward, uh, perihelion, then <clears throat> at this point in time, it would have been, at that point in time, it would have been 8.6 billion miles. Well, now here in 1990 in his diagram, he's got it down at 6.6 .6 billion. Well, if you were to actually go one step further and assume those two calculations are correct based on him, You've got two points in time and you can calculate the velocity. Sure. The, the real question is, you know, how many uh, astronomical units is the boo really from the sun? And because we don't know whether Neugebauer is telling the truth about 50 billion miles. No, just because Neugebauer said their IRS said it was 50 billion miles away in 1981 doesn't mean it was at aphelion. Okay. We didn't, you know, we, it was somewhere in its orbit. It was, that's not how far away it was. So you could calculate the rate part. Okay. Gotcha. So gotcha. I think there is an ephemeral calculation where you can take, if you knew the mass exactly, you can calculate what the orbit would be to be 3,600 years. And it would tell you how many astronomical units it is away from the sun. And I'll, I can take this one step further and do that. Okay. But just based on a linear analysis, um, to see if Harrington's chart was the scale, it looks like it possibly was. Because mm -hmm. 6.6 .6 billion miles is just outside of the 3.6 billion miles for Pluto, and it's less than the 8.67 billion miles that it would have been in 1981 when he first discussed it. That allows it allows it time to get to where it is in 1990, basically. Well, that means Neugebauer and him are off by 43.34 billion years away. If anything, okay, if anything, it indicates that. Um, Neugebauer is off with his data and that uh, Harrington was right on the money with his data and that his drawing was to scale as well. It, it seems to indicate... Well, that I went back and forth questioning whether it was to scale and now that I've come back and looked at the document, realized what he said and what he did in 1991 where he went to New Zealand to actually look at it with an 8-inch scope, that means it was coming in close. Listen, I used to have a, a telescope. <laughs> And it was a, a variety called a Schmidt Cassegrain. I know them, yeah. And the reason, the reason those are popular is because you can get a lot of, uh, length in your viewing angle and have a short, short longitudinal tube. axis because it uses a reflection inside. 
Yeah, it's like right? half the length of a normal uh, Newtonian or Dobson. Exactly. Exactly. So if he had a, a only an eight inch scope, I suspect it was a Schmidt cast. Well, I've used one of those, and and I know what the limitations are. I mean, you, you've got to have something in pretty close to be looking at something with an eight inch scope. So what I'm saying is, Harrington was on to something in 1991 where he went to look at it and was about to disclose this. That means it was inside the orbit of Pluto by that point. To me, that's what that means. Hmm. For him to be able to take an 8-inch scope and see it, and this is where it gets really crazy in some of the analysis I did, okay? <clears throat> Are you with me? I'm, I'm here, bro. I'm here. Yeah, so at this point in time, I'm starting to bounce a couple things through my head going, well, okay, well, let's be conservative and assume that Neugebauer's distance of 50 billion miles could be used, and let's even be, further worst case, let's assume that's at aphelion, okay, that it's in its farthest orbit, just for fun. Maybe that's why he gave that number, don't know. But that number's important in order to determine the correct speed, okay, because we have the time, we know it takes 1,800 years if you believe half of a SAR is what it would take to come in and then another half SAR to go out. Sure. Right? Sure. So that number comes out to be twenty seven million seven hundred and seventy seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven miles per year if you use fifty billion miles in eighteen hundred years. That's what I call the Neugebauer rate. <clears throat> so what can we do with that? Well we can then use that to see how long it would take Nibiru to come inbound, okay? And uh Instead of going from a historical point in time in the past, we could take this ob ob observation, whether Harrington's right or whether Neugebauer's right, uh, we have some data from a real satellite or from, a, from an IRAS scope. Okay? Sure. And that's, that's really important to stay scientific here. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, a couple of things we need to know to play these games. And we're going to use Pluto as an outer boundary because it's the last one out there uh, at the edge of our known solar system. Sands and Nibiru, and it sits at six three point six seven five zero zero five zero uh, billion miles. Okay, so it's three point. I ca just call it three point six seven billion miles. Okay, from the sun. All right. So how many years does it take Pluto to come to its inner orbit or perihelion with the sun? Well, we know what this is. It's two hundred forty eight years. Okay. So here's something in my head I would use as a milestone. That if Nibiru came parallel to Pluto and traveled at the same rate that Pluto did, it would take 248 years to make the perihelion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> there's something else that you have to consider here is the, uh, when a planet comes close to the, the central sun and goes around it and then goes back out to its orbit, especially if it's an elliptical orbit, which most of them are, the, especially the outer planets, then it gets a little slingshot effect. Uh, when it comes in close, okay? So it travels faster near the sun than it does when it's at the furthest point away from the sun. So it's not, so what I have calculated for Neugebauer's rate is an average speed, but it does not take into account the slingshot effect, okay? Yeah. And it's very significant. Oh, yeah, especially on the elliptical, uh, which is, you know, taking Nibiru's highly elliptical orbit, that's got to be a pretty right, high, right, high right. So And also based on its size, and I messed around with a little bit, and I think I have a figure, that basically it will be 20 times faster at aphelion or perihelion than it would be at aphelion, meaning the furthest distance away. It's going to be slower by a factor of 20 and faster by a factor of 20 when you get close to the sun. Wow. Okay. So we need, yeah, so that's significant. So anyway, so, uh, so now we have a marker 248 years that it takes Pluto at the edge of our solar system to come in around the sun. Okay. There's just something real physical and tangible that we can compare with. Right. So if, so where we left off was if Nibiru got parallel with Pluto, how long would it take? Well, that comes down to how fast it's traveling. Okay. So this, this becomes the next important thing. So we just said that Harrington with his eight inch scope in New Zealand at this special location at this particular point in time must have thought he could see Nibiru coming in from the southern hemisphere about to cross our solar ecliptic and go in behind the sun where it would be lost for some period of years or or partial portion of a year 
and then re-emerge as it's heading back out toward uh, aphelion. Okay, so how long does it take by the time it crosses our uh, Mars, Jupiter, or, or apparently between Mars and Jupiter is where it crosses uh, near the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. And that would be the place where it would cross our solar ecliptic and then go back behind our sun, ricochet around it, or slingshot around it, and then come back out to the other side, right? So, so, in my opinion, uh, Harrington had to have thought it was coming close to the point where he could see it in the galactic ecliptic, meaning it, it was not only inside Pluto, but was approaching the place where he could see it, um, uh, coming between Mars and Jupiter. So that's like, wow, that's really advanced if it was that far in. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, so so we got this marker 248 years. Don't forget, don't don't lose track of that. So so the next thing I thought, well, what if um what if it comes up parallel with Pluto based on this Neugebauer rate, how long would it take to come inbound to the Earth? I mean to the Sun at perihelion. Well, that number turns out to be 3.67 billion miles divided by Neugebauer's rate, that 27 million number I told you. Yep. Well, that comes out to 132 years. So now all of a sudden you go, okay, well, if that's true, then about 1990 or so when he met with Her when he met with uh, Sitchin, when Harrington met with Sitchin, he said it was five billion. So that was that. So it was still about five billion miles outside of Pluto. That's only three point six billion. So, you know, maybe nineteen ninety five. Okay, we'll pick that point and say, well, okay, it's parallel with Pluto. How long would it take to come in? Well, we said one hundred thirty two years at the Neugebauer rate. So that would be, you know, at one hundred thirty two to nineteen uh, ninety five. Well, that still puts it for a piece out, right? Sure. The problem is, it doesn't take into account the slingshot rate, because this is the average rate for Neugebauer to go the whole, whole way around. Okay. So this, this is where the ephemeral calculations are very important. It's, okay? it's, it's an average rate and it's also conservative too, Gerald. But yes. It's so very, it, it's, cons it's conservative because if the plant, if Nabu would, would actually have been at um, aphelion, its further distant point when they saw it, and then you calculate, divide it by 1800, you could see that number would be bigger, so it would be faster. So it's very conservative, okay? Um, and then I thought, okay, well, let's suppose that um, Harrington's orbital chart that we think now was to scale uh, indicated that Nibiru was 6.66 billion miles away in mm -hmm. 1990, in August. Okay, so now we have a specific date, a specific location. Let's use this average rate and see what the worst case would be. Well, that number comes out using Neugebauer's rate to be 239 years from the point where he showed it on that map, which is outside of Pluto. Okay? Sure. So I batted about in my document, well, maybe... You know, that's because it wasn't to scale. Then I noted that, uh, if you took 1983 and added 33 years, it came out to 2016. And I'll show you, and I'm not, not going to tell you why I did that, but you'll see it in the document. Okay. It's, it's quite significant. So it comes out to 2016. Very interesting. So, so in the first uh, table that I did, table three, I call it the, the Nibiru transit table. I took the distance from Pluto as the outer edge. We knew that was about 248 years. Took Neugebauer's rate, and then I added a few scalars, one through five, to add this slingshot effect, because I didn't know what it was for a planet the size of Nibiru. Well, it turns out I found a little bit more about it later. Well, I so we said at a scalar of one, it takes 132 years to come in. So that would put you in at 2115. That's a long ways away. Okay. You, you take 90. that scale, you take that scalar up to two. It goes, it cuts it in half. Now you're at 2049. And let's go all the way up to five or number four, a velocity scalar of four. Now you're looking number of years to perihelion is 33. There's that 33 I was just telling you about. And that comes out to the year 2016. So all of a sudden I saw this and I thought, hmm, <laughs> those couple of those numbers are, kind of looking real now this this could be real okay it, it is and okay. here's the thing gerald this is very realistic and conservative math it's not extravagant it's not working the numbers this is basically accommodating all the known factors that we have 
Well, actually, when, I'll tell you right now. When I went further and looked up the slingshot effect of a planet in perihelion, it looks like the speed the speed factor could be a factor of 20 different. I only went up to 5, and it landed us conservatively from the edge of Pluto inward at the year 2016, only using a scalar of 4. I can go all the way up to 20 based on what I know. So that adds some corrective factor to the bad Neugebauer rate because we didn't have the measurement of the planet at aphelion. Okay, so that's where the conservative part of this comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go up to a fact a scalar of five, that shows that the it would have cro crossed perihelion in 2009. Okay, so then you ask yourself, well, how long could it be behind the sun? Well, this data that I had showed that from the time it comes inside of Neptune to the time it comes back out it takes 30 years. Whereas at the other end, at, ap at aphelion, it takes um, 800 years to do the same distance. Remember the factor of 20. Wow. Or 600 years. 600. It was a factor of 20. So 30, 30 on one and eight and 600 on the other. <clears throat> so now all of a sudden you say, well, by the time it gets near, near Neptune, you mean it could be all the way at perihelion within 30 years? Uh, sure enough could. So the next thing I did is I, I took um, Harrington's distance of 6.6 .6 billion miles, which was 5 billion miles, or the one from his orbital chart. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, it looks like it was to scale. In the worst case, we could take that number to 8.67 billion miles, which is not a long distance in astronomical terms. Okay. No, no, no. And we could use that as our, as our point to calculate how long it would take Naboo to come into perihelion with the sun, just like we did if it was parallel with Pluto. So this is just outside of Pluto. Using the Neugebauer rate again, and this time I added a few more scalars because um, I wanted to see what it would take to get it into um, the time frame of right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and see if it could be potentially correlated with the Earth changes, the change in our gravitational North Pole, and some other things that uh, science seems to have corroborated that that, that is happening. Okay, so I'll just skip forward. If you go to a scalar factor of seven, then that lands you at 2017. And if you go to a scalar factor of eight, it lands you. It looks like I have a mistake in the table. I got to fix that. It lands you at 20, 2012. Okay, so between only a scalar factor of seven and eight, it lands us into our current time frame again. And like I told you, the, the scalar factor looks like it should be as high as 20. So, if, if Harrington, if that's true, well, let's just, let's just play a game. If he was in, um, New Zealand in 1991, where he died trying to see this planet. Yep. And it was as close in as, uh, potentially approaching the galactic ecliptic, or the solar ecliptic coming in from the south in, uh, in the constellation of Libra near Cassiopeia, like he said, mm -hmm. then it, it could have been just, it could have been just this side of Jupiter. Okay. And if that's the case, then we're already uh, a few planets in from, from Pluto and this, and this number would be short. So let's, so all of a sudden you realize that either one of these tables, if you take into account the, the Neugebauer rate is probably off, and the slingshot effect can go all the way up to 20. What I'm telling you is that from the time he looked at it to right now, and you basically you you would only have to add about 18 to 22 years, something in that range, okay? And you would go from 1991 and add that, and you land in our our current time frame. So what I'm telling you is. The numbers Nibiru, are really terrible. It's not only due, but it looks like it's in potentially in perihelion right now. Yeah, the numbers are real. I mean, I'm looking at the tables here. I mean, I, I urge the people, if you want to understand this and you want to get a grip on this, it's, it's the, the, the math is a lot easier to understand with the tables and the graphs and, 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 the, and it's, and it's quite simple and logical to, to follow. It's just a couple of simple equations and, uh, you've done it really well as well, Gerald. I mean, the numbers make sense. I mean, the numbers are very realistic. And the window, the window, Gerald, is the window that we're in now. 
Uh, it, yeah, well, that, this is what kind of put uh, a few chills on the back of my neck and realized, kind of like, this brought me full circle. You realize um, in my first book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, I took a lot of the research on Nibiru and figured everybody was at this place trying to pr prove that the Anunnaki were real and that their planet was real. And everybody was in this defensive posture and all, and it was all information being presented in a way to uh, defend the theory. And I decided to do something a little differently where I took already um, translated Sumerian documents. I wasn't defending the translation and I took them from a source other than Sitchin, because the poor guy was under assault at the time, and I took him from the Oxford University, right? Those three basic ones, all you need to do to get the story, it's there. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and went forward. And so I, I looked at everything that was going on with Nibiru. I decoded the Enuma Elish. I knew about it from way back when from reading Sitchin's documents. And so I was, I was kind of already comfortable with the idea that this planet was out there, but because of all the disinformation, um, in my mind, it had kind of gotten it kind of gotten cloudy. Just where the hell is it, right? It is so, a but af but after I spent a week and and just used the scientific method, which which works for me, okay, yeah, uh, and saw the numbers, it was irrefutable to me that uh, there could be people out there that do have pictures of two suns uh, in the morning, and those might be real and i'm gonna go have to go look at those now because i i really think the numbers just cannot be refuted i mean are we saying gerald this thing is only visible in the southern hemisphere is that correct well what i'm saying is if if harrington thought he could see it with an eight inch scope in 1991 fast forward to now so that's uh <clears throat> how many years is that that's uh 10 years would be 2001 and then add another so that'd be 26 years mm -hmm. it's been 26 years well what did we just say about the entire transition from the buru from this inner se segment of the elliptical arc i told you it took it looks like it only takes 30 years to go from the point just inside jupiter all the way around guess what it's been 26 years that means it's in perihelion and it's about to come out or it's just coming out and we're just now starting to see it. And these people that are claiming to have pictures of two suns, I mean, they're not just a few of them, they're all over the world, um, would explain uh, a planet <laughs> that's reflecting the sunlight that appear that's in, in or close to coming out from right behind the sun so that you can see it. Now, the real question is, uh, what happens next? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and they say in Hamlet's Mill that it is the brightest star in the sky. Nibiru is the brightest star. It ref makes reference to that. Um, you know, it, this is incredibly, just as to say, John, it is an incredibly difficult task that we're doing here today. It's incredibly difficult to pinpoint Nibiru, to calculate the distance of Nibiru. I mean, but there are, is a line of research and there is a line of inquiry that you just explained with the scientific method that puts us in tangible uh, parameters we can say look it's in this window here and you know if this is conservative information it could be actually right upon us or it could be not too far from us but this window is a lot narrower than we think it is Gerald. yeah you know recently i've just had a thought that this uh lucifer infrared scope that was put on mount graham in tucson mm -hmm. uh, i wonder if the timing of when that was built is indicative of where uh, Nibiru was because you realize if you're in Arizona, you're not you're not down on uh, the South Pole Observatory. You know you're you're in the Northern Hemisphere trying to see this thing now. And that means that scope had to be set up to look at it coming out of perihelion. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, if I go back and look, well, when was that thing put together? I think it was around 2007 or eight, something like that. 2009. Yeah. So they put everything in place, made sure they had it functional and blah, blah, blah for some period of time before the actual event where they could start seeing it. So I would say, you know, I personally think around 2013, I think it went into, I think it went fully into perihelion from what I can tell, but based on my calculations here. 
Can we talk about the Google Sky uh, analysis, Gerald? Oh, I sure. I want to mention yeah, this, yeah. the picture on Google Sky is the one that I've been seeing. I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of this, but uh, it's, it looks like there's two horns on it, um, like the wing disc. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> we, we had a pic, one photo, by the way, we, we, we kind of passed over this, but we had one photo I found on the internet. This is figure 14 in my, uh, in my document here on page, what page is on? Page 30. Okay, that, that apparently got leaked. I, I don't generally like to follow threads where I can't get any tangible data, but it's the only one that supposedly was leaked from NASA. Now, I can't back that up, but I just thought I'd provide it in a link to where it came from so people can look that up. Um, yeah, so, so I put that up there. But as far as Google Sky goes, I think this is a really neat tool. Uh, I don't know if people have ever used it. And, you know, you've got the Google Earth that lets you, lets you uh, navigate the whole uh, spherical globe of the planet, <laughs> which is really fun. Mm -hmm. And also now they have this Google Sky, so you can bring up this tool. So you have Google Earth open. It's one of the task menus or the menu items at the top that lets you change the sky mode. Well, uh, a lot of people use this for looking at uh, ephemeris and orbits and, and lots of different things. And I thought, well, um, if Harrington was looking in the constellation Libra in the southern hemisphere for this thing to come in, what what do we have in the reports on the Internet, whether it's fallacy or fact, that corroborate with some object that's been found that might be this item that maybe have a different designator or something like that, right? So I started looking around and, uh, I found some, uh, conspiratorial kind of things. Whether it's true or not, I can't say. But one, one, uh, link on, uh, Google Sky came up and said, Hey, here's a position in Google Sky where, uh, we think Nibiru is. And, uh, they had classified it as HD 37784. Now I, I got to go back and look back at NASA now and, and see everything I can find about HD three seven seven eight four and why you know why that was chosen. And it turns out it's in a constellation that uh, looks like Scorpio, not Libra. So so anything that showed up in Harrington's orbital chart from uh, Libra over all the way down to uh, or from Libra all the way up to uh, Pisces, I believe it was. I, I made it fair game to uh, possibly observe it in Google Sky and see what I could find. Okay, so so I went through this, and even there was an area that some people claimed where Nibiru was on the online uh, multiverse that was blacked out by Google. And I thought, well, those are always interesting areas. Why would you black out an area unless you just didn't want people to look there, right? So, so I gave the coordinates of that. I went to try to find it, and I was unable to find that, but. If you could find what that is, it'd probably be pretty telling if they're uh, eliminating some data so that you can't see it, okay? Given what we know about NASA and their, and their connection with Google and uh, the three-letter agencies, okay? So anyway, I put HD37784, Google Sky, and it brings up uh, kind of this bright constellation. And then right next to it, just down and to the left, you can see this winged-looking disk planet that's somewhat orangish red that people have claimed is Nibiru. And I thought, okay, well, great. There's a picture. It's pretty big. Uh, you can't tell much else from it. So I went, that's figure 15. Then I went and looked it up on um, Google Sky with a, just a different uh, perspective, zoomed out a little bit so I could see where it was. It was just um, north of Orion's belt, uh, north of Betelgeuse, and, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, it wasn't hard to find if you went from there, okay? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's one, right next to 121 Tau as well. Okay, but anyway, I, I gave you a picture of it, and actually the uh, coordinates show up in the lat long, so you can put it in if you want. But if you just put HD space 37784, it'll bring it in, you can zoom out and see this view. Okay, well... I went to skymap.org uh, based on this information on this on this uh, reporting. It was reported in 1989, by the way, and they called it HD 1989. It was called Tycho 2-2000 as another name, uh, USNO-A2.0, 
So that's the United States Naval Organization, Naval Observatory. That's where Harrington worked. Okay. Then there's a BSC. I'm not sure what that means, but it was dated 1991. So this one kind of got my attention. I thought, well, maybe there's something here mm -hmm. listed in the constellation Taurus. Uh, we have the coordinates for it. And I thought, well, it kind of has the attributes of Nibiru with that, with that, you know, that, uh, looks like a wings coming off the side, which is shown on some of their depictions for Nibiru. So I thought, okay, well, it's conspiratorial. I don't view it as hard scientific, but here's what we have. So I, I provided that as well. Okay. And they also gave you the distance it's, it's away. Incredible job. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's stuff out there. Um, uh, I, I don't know if that's it, but, uh, it gives you something to look at. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Let's I was going to include some of the pictures of the two sons that uh, everybody's talking about calling it Nibiru. Listen, I've dismissed every one of those. Number one, I started out dismissing anything that saw it before it was in uh, inside of our uh, inside of Pluto, for that matter, unless you had a IRS scope, because because of the temperature of the planet and being that far away from the sun, you just could not see it without a super cool device. Mm -hmm. Now, once you got in closer. Uh, Seeing it with the naked eye, or potentially with a with a, a scope like Harrington had, is possible. All right. So uh, where does where does that take us to? Um, possibly uh, down to what the Colburn Bible had to say about this, or what do you oh, think? Oh yeah, let's mention the Colburn Bible. I'm not entirely sure on the background of the Colburn Bible, but uh, I, I actually would, until today, show Gerald, I wasn't even I I've heard of the Colburn Colburn Bible by name. I never looked at it before, never looked into it, but, uh, it's incredibly, incredibly interesting document, John. <laughs> it is, you know, I tried to follow the creation of count of man in the Colburn Bible, trying to correlate the names with the Anunnaki and such, and, and I have to be honest with you, I really couldn't make the correlation. There's some very interesting correlations between the functional story, um, and also a lot of stuff about Nibiru. That's the part I kind of wanted to focus on. Um, and it's, that's from the book of creation, chapter three. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, they, they talk about Nibiru, planet X, uh, being a very large, uh, it says it's cold, but bright. And beneath its belly was a, a huge trail of smoke and uh, debris that it drags along. And, and basically that, seems to be the, the genesis of where the depictions of it calling it a dragon were, you know, in the sky, that it's this long uh, entourage of debris that gets dragged through the asteroid belt when it comes through. Because remember, it crosses between Mars and Jupiter, and that's where the asteroid belt is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it talks about, uh, significantly in the Colburn Bible, about it being a destroyer planet, and that every time it did come through, I mean, it, the descriptions, and I don't know that we want to get all into that. It's kind of like revelations. It, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, vivid as it talks about what this planet does as it comes through. It talks about it burning the surface of the planet. Oh, gruesome. Blowing yeah. all the water off. Uh, nothing survives, okay? Um, men were stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. Well, where have we heard that before? That came right out of Revelations, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's talking about Wormwood and, and all the, the the evils that came with the uh, plagues of Egypt. Well, a lot of people have seen that as a, a comet or a planet crossing that caused a lot of perturbations in space and caused those pestilences and plagues to happen on the Earth. So they, they kind of see it as, as related. And, uh, and so does the Colburn Bible. Incredible stuff, Gerald. You know, for me, Nibiru is real. I, I have no doubt about it. From ancient texts or scientific data or both, I mean, it, it, Nibiru is real. Is, is it incoming? It's incoming. It's just a matter of how far on that journey it is. And I think we've got some answers today, Gerald. I think we've reduced the data down to some very, very synthesized uh, analysis. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, how accurate can you try and refine your data now at this stage, Gerald? 
Uh, but it's well, incredibly... like I said, only those who have the ephemeris for the planet could actually answer exactly where it is. Yeah. Um, based on our narrowing it down and all the evidence, I would not have believed it had I not sat down and put all the numbers in front of me, but I truly believe that it's already in perihelion. Yeah, which is a difficult task, but I keep telling you this, Gerald. I mean, you, I'm sure you know more than anybody. I mean, this took you a week to prepare for this show, but uh, I commend you on that. It's an excellent document you put together, and, and it's backed up with just the pure facts and the pure science and the pure logic of it. Um, uh, let's speculate a bit, Gerald, just to just to wrap up. I mean, okay, just yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to go too heavy on on um, fear mongering, but I mean, NASA knows about this. I mean, I've no doubt. I mean, if this thing is coming in and it's where we think it is, or it's even you know, approaching us. I mean, they, they, NASA's known about this for a long time. Governments have known about this yeah. for a long time, Gerald. Yeah, I think every government on the planet knows about it. And, you know, recently from NASA, we've heard about, oh, we, we're going out looking for these uh, Earth-like uh, planets all over our galaxy now that we realize there's so many. And then just recently, and I, I was looking for it just yesterday or day before, the, I heard that uh, NASA had announced this new a uh, planet that they had found uh, inside of Neptune. And I was like, what? <laughs> or a new body of some sort. And I was mm-hmm. like, really? No matter w- whether it was a comet or a planet, I can't remember. Uh, it was, But it was significant news, and I couldn't find it in time to get it into this document, but uh, I wanted to. Um, you know, so fast-forwarding to now, uh, people can look around um, the planet and go, well, Let's assume that it was true. How would, how would people respond? Well, you can go to like the movie 2012 and look how the government responded. Don't tell anybody. Have a refugee plan for those that have been, that are serving the government, you know, or continuity of government. And everybody else gets uh, sacrificed and not told. Sure. Um, you know, and I thought about that. You know, that's very conspiratorial. But let, let's play a game. For I think a it's very realistic, you know, Gerald. I don't think it's conspiracy. I think it's very realistic. I don't think. Well, yeah. Well, let's pl- let's play another game. Uh, you know, uh, the Cold War went on since the fifties with Russia since World War Two, mm-hmm. and uh, at some point, um, it, it got so bad here in the United States that we believed a, a nuclear assault was imminent on our homeland, and people were building underground shelters left and right all over the country. Okay, and at the same time, everybody realized that they were vulnerable, too, from an intercontinental ballistic missile, all governments around the world. And they started burrowing in, at at least initially at their presidential headquarters, you know, underground bases where they could survive a surface impact from a nuclear device, or even one that blew up above the surface and caused an EMP, right? Well, they could still do just as much damage depending on what altitude they were exploded. So... So the, the general idea is everybody realized there's a danger from the air and that they had to have a survival plan for continuity of government first underground. And some countries like Russia went so far as to build underground facilities to their entire populace, whereas other ones uh, didn't, like the United States, or at least they didn't tell you if they did. Well, I, oh. I think the underground bases, though, Gerald, have been on the increase since the ERA satellite data. And I think that the nuclear arsenal is actually, uh, they're, well, it's on the de- decline. They're decommissioning nuclear subs and nuclear, not totally. I mean, they're, they're trying to reduce the numbers. They're not trying to increase it. They're trying to reduce the numbers of nuclear arsenal. That doesn't make sense to me that they're still in this nuclear mode or they're still in this uh nuclear operation i think that they're trying to decrease the nuclear arms because they realize that they're not going to push the button uh, well, out, of, yeah. out of out of all the nuclear out of all the nuclear arsenal and the stockpiles that are out there gerald they cannot let one of them off again not one of them they just can't if they if if americans ever did what they did on hiroshima again they would be shunned on this planet there's nobody would speak to them they they did what they did back in 19 19- uh, 45 in the World War Two when they dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, I mean, they did what they did back then. I mean, that was the first time ever. Um, you know, if they ever did that again, Gerald, they, they would be frowned upon. There was nobody be, be, I mean, where would they do it anyway? It's just the most inhumane thing to do, just to incinerate people like that, you know? 
Um, you know, so they can't do it. They know they can't do it. I mean, even if they wanted to flex their muscles and control somebody, wouldn't matter how bad that other nation was or what that nation did. They just can't do it, and they know they can't do it. So the, the yeah, nuclear but they, arsenal... But, but they can take uh, depleted uranium and put it into armament, fire it onto a foreign country's battlefield, and leave it there radiating and get away with it that way. Oh, sure. Sure. <clears throat> so, yeah, well... You know, we're kind of getting into a little bit about conspiratorial things and corroborating actions by governments and peoples to determine, is this information real? And if it was, how would they respond? In general, that's what we're saying. Yeah. So, you know, so the fact that there's been uh, a catalyst to cause governments to build underground facilities since the 1950s, um, that one isn't um, all telling for me. Has there been an increase in underground preparation and um, stirring up the rat nest for water and food and so and so forth since oh the first article was released by Harrington in 1981? Possibly that's a very good theory, and if that could be corroborated, then you could say the actions that are being taken for building underground tunnels and connecting them to cities and putting maglev trains and spending our money like that and and then leaving you out with no plan uh, would make a lot of sense to me. Look at right the now, in my head, the fact is we can't distinguish the actions of the governments for going underground, whether it's based on the threat of nuclear war or whether it's the threat of Nibiru. And actually, I think they're playing that card very well. Because yeah. guess what? Whichever one it was, um, they have overlapping functions by having a underground facility that could survive either a nuclear winter or the passage of Nibiru. Uh, overlapping at least they think is, so. At least they think so. Uh, overlapping function is the key term, Gerald. I mean, maybe they started off with a nuclear uh, scare uh, as the motive, but it's migrated into Nibiru, and they went, "Well, we already got these uh, underground bunkers. Let's expand on that." And that's now become the new motive, but like there's an overlapping function here for sure, Gerald. Look at the Falbard uh, s a seed vault as well, Gerald. I mean, right. hey, I was looking at something today on this capabilities for building underground tunnels. Oh my goodness, I had no idea they had rail devices that are shooting out a plasma laser that are melting uh, cylindrical holes in the material, not even having to excavate. Mm -hmm. And they're doing miles at a time in a day. That is unbelievable with this automated device. <laughs> Think about that. Sure. So, yeah. you know, did they put a tunnel system all into the United States since the 1950s uh, during the Cold War up until now in preparation for surviving a nuclear winter or the, or the cyclical destruction of the per periodic cyclical destruction of the surface of the planet Earth? Based on uh, its interactions with a very large planet that comes around every thirty six hundred years, you know. And by the way, I sent you a table uh, start with some assumptions about some of these start dates and Sumerian kings list back, the Sumerian mm -hmm. kings list forward, and then using these other calculations to see if that was a passage event, what the all the other ones were, so you could see forward and backward in time, and then try to corroborate those with events that we knew of in history so i i did a lot of thinking about this last week okay is what i want you to know sure and uh, i thought that was very telling as well based on the last one i sent you assuming that harrington's data was correct um it, it lines up very well with some significant events in history ice age toss building giza um yep you know. yeah even with uh some of the creation uh, and i know we're not going to talk much about it but uh even corresponds with uh, the time frame that Enki was on this planet, and the time frame when humans were were uh, genetically known to have been spawned about two hundred twenty thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of, there's a whole bunch of correlations in there that I thought, aha, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just to just to surmise, I mean, yeah, without getting too conspiratorial, I mean, I have no doubt. I mean, if these guys know this thing's coming in, they're going to prepare, Gerald. They're going to prepare, and they're going to prepare for the worst. But they're probably already doing that anyway. They've, they've probably okay. got some, the the elitists uh, of, of of the military governments of the world. They've probably got so much money, Gerald. Um, they don't know what to do with it. They've probably nothing else better to do with their bloody money than to start digging tunnels and building safe houses. Just a, a point worth noting, though, Gerald. This is for the audience. 
the human race spends 80% of its time undercover. Whether that's in your car or in your house, protecting yourself from sun or rain or extreme weather or underground or inside buildings. The human race spends 80% of its time in undercover. Uh, you know, and that's, that's what we do as a human race. Whether you're driving to and from work, you're under the roof of your car, you're in work, you're in your home, you're, you're 80, 20% of the time is outside. So we are already a race that lives undercover. Um, you know, it's because we have to, like, you know, it's, we protect ourselves from just even normal weather that we don't like, you know, but to, uh, to face, uh, something dangerous like Nibiru coming in, if it is a close crossing, if it is close and it affects us, um, maybe, maybe it's not, Gerald, maybe it's just gonna come by and, and, and have mild effects like heating up volcanoes and, some magnetic effects. I mean, it's it, it, well, it, you know, it, it looks like uh, I think it's come, I think several times it, it comes by where it actually maybe um, causes you know some effects, but they're not as devastating every single time. It really just depends on where the Earth is relative to when it comes at the crossing point. And by the way, they called it the planet of crossing in the in the Illish as well yeah. for that reason. Yeah. So, um, so you know. This, you know, so here, here in my mind, I have trouble distinguishing between the adjacent planets experiencing what they're experiencing right now, which is change, as well as our Earth experiencing change, whether that is completely attributable to us passing through the galactic center, which I don't know exactly how long that takes once you start going through there. Well, the Mayan said it started happening around, uh, 2011. So how long does it take to go through the Galactic Center? Maybe three years, three and a half years? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. So maybe we're just coming out of that now. But, and that's where we have this encounter with Nibiru where it first got trapped in our solar system the first time. Mm-hmm. Don't know. But mm-hmm. that, but those two seem to be correlated. So, you know, are our bottom line is, are the Earth changes that are taking place? And those changes are undeniable in yeah. my mind. I think we looked at the report yesterday. There were 41 earthquakes or volcanoes going off at the same time. Simultaneously. Yeah. Now, sometimes they'll get 50 in a year, but not like, not simultaneous. Yeah. Which is incredible. And we've had some very large earthquakes uh, that seem to be correlated with uh, planetary locations that people have been tracking. So, um, you know, there, there are definitely, changes going on in the weather patterns and the and the, the the gravitational north pole has been moving around and it, so something is tugging on the earth and whether it's the the rota- the torsion from a a dense field that would be at the galactic center based on the gravity differential there and our earth spinning and going through it like a gyroscope like I talked about in my first book or mm-hmm. Is from the Buru passing through with its, with its constellation, by the way, to the south, causing the, the Earth's orbital plane to tilt slightly. And if it, if it did it just right, um, it could cause the Earth to wobble a little bit and cause a very large flood on the surface. And this, you know, this goes back to, uh, writings about Charles Hapgood and such, whether he was cre- credited or not, but you know there were there were writings about these kind of things, um, Velikovsky's writing, and also this uh, uh, Hamlet Mill document you gave me, you know, and uh, the Colburn Bible. There, there's clearly something that periodically comes through and disturbs uh, life on the, this planet, uh, usually resulting from disturbing the sun, causing a, a CME. Or some sort of discharge, such that the, the surface becomes uninhabitable, or uh, could result in a watery death if the uh, if the Earth gets wobbled on its axis. Mm-hmm. Wow. And and right now it looks like we're not getting wobbled, but we're definitely getting pulled off our axis. Well, what if the thing that's pulling us off the axis um, goes away? Will we slowly come back uh, and not have a a Flood event? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, the other concern is when it does come around and goes back out toward Aphelion, it's going to be dragging all these asteroids that brought in the per- perihelion with it. Sure. And when those cross the solar ecliptic, uh, where all of our planets rotate in 
the opposite direction, they're going to have an encounter with some of this debris. So that's another concern that uh, some people are probably concerned about. Wow. Well, Gerald, we're out of time. We're at the top of the second hour. Uh, of course, GeraldClark77.com. You'll catch the article that Gerald did for today's show there. Of course, I'll stick a, a link in the YouTube description if you're listening on YouTube. And uh, uh, great research, Gerald. Great. I commend you on that today. I really thank you for that. You know, it's it's, it's great to get to some answers and some realistic uh, discussion based on science. Do you, feel, do you feel like you got to some answers today? I do, I do, and I, and and it's because of the logic and the science that we follow. You know, follow the scientific methods. You know, you know, don't get too wild on, on your on your, keep keep some, some conservative approach there. And, and we did that, Gerald. And uh, you know, but you also you also have to allow your imagination to say what if to see if, if dots connect so that you can establish a new theory. You know, because yeah. science is nothing but a bunch of uh, theories that are supported by facts. Well, you know, so you, you, you can't be afraid to, and I've been very conservative that way, is to, especially with something that's life and death like this, is to make inferences. And, uh, I do want to just put a plug out there and say, I wrote a very long conclusion to this document that's 49, the whole document's 49 pages long. From, uh, so I about, wrote about six pages in the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the data's real, Mm -hmm. And the tunnel building and the government's plan to continue itself involves underground facilities, then you're not invited. Hey, you've got some emotional issues to deal with and some real life decisions to make that have to do with facing your Faustian cliff and your own death. And that's intense for people. That's probably why this topic is one of the number one topics to be looked at on the internet right now. It's just unbelievable how much interest there is. I think that's what well, drives. Yeah, I think that's what gathers the attention, Gerald. You know, as negative as it is, I think that's what gathers the attention. I know. Attention. Well, so I, I tried to do, at least make an attempt at my position on how I would face this event and, and what I, how I see myself in a bigger scheme relative to some of the other writings that I've done in my, especially in the second book. So I won't tell you what it is now, but I, I hope, I hope it, uh, hits its mark. Mm -hmm. Because it's very, very, it's, it's a very deep topic. It's very, it's very intense for people to, it's like finding out you have cancer and you got six months to live. <laughs> now exactly. Exactly. Are you going to, are you going to go, are you going to go fill out a bucket list and go experience the hedonism of the external world to the best that you did? So you didn't feel like you missed a thing or are you going to go inside and try to figure out what this evolution and ascension thing is all about? Mm -hmm. I thought it's, you mentioned it's a deep, deep, deep thing that it, it brings up whenever you look at this data and it hits you right between the eyes. I'm glad you mentioned Ascension there. You reminded me of the, uh, the Ascension Symposium in uh, discussing the Anunnaki uh, in, the, in the Yucatan, Gerald, where you have a conference coming up September. Uh, there's limited places, so if anybody wants to get involved with the limited uh, places, uh, sign up at GeraldClark77.com or you can see it on JamesSwagger.com as well. Uh, you know, catch myself and Gerald there doing a small, cozy symposium. Um, you know, we're going to talk about all sorts of wonderful stuff and uh, you can catch the whole program, what we're going to do there. Um, but Gerald, I really thank you for your time today and I appreciate the, the effort you put in for today's show. Um, you know, what a production and, and a great article. I mean, um, so it's almost like a mini book, Gerald. It really is. And, uh, I really thank you for that. Well, you know, us, us engineers, uh, you being one, we connected as engineers and we have expectations about doing things right. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> and the devil's in the details. So, uh, you know, if you want people to be able to follow the threads and get to an answer, you don't do stuff and put your arms around it and say, well, this is mine. It's all about my ego. And, you know, I should be, <laughs> I should be giving tenure here. You know, instead yeah. it's, we're approaching this from a different standpoint. You and I aren't being paid anything to do this. Sure. But to just explore the truth. And, uh, and I appreciate that about you as well, because I know it, not any, not everybody would sit down and read a 49 page document before committing to do a radio show. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, you expect a lot from me, but I expect a lot from you too. And, and it works for us. No, it's cool, bro. It's cool. Well, Gerald, uh, we'll pick up the podcast on the Emerald Tablets next time. But for now, uh, we'll finish off the show and uh, I look forward to the next show in the not too distant future. Me too, brother. It's been great. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's polar orbit, mm -hmm. which would cause uh, great disturbances on a watery planet. And that seems to be the ongoing historical record.
flood after flood after flood, whether it's a major or minor one. So it really is a function of, uh, like you said, where Nabooer is when it comes through. Now, is there anything in the chronology, um, it's a vital line of research, Gerald, for these Nibiru passings, is there anything in the chronology that we can say is a definite? Well, I, I, I thought I had some definite points from my Sumerian readings before, and I was glomming on to 3760 BCE because it seemed like a very important one. I was going to go and look up the story that was connected to that to see if I, it had any legs. And uh, I, I didn't get around to looking back at that one. But I thought, well, let me just put it in a, an Excel spreadsheet, assume that is the date, and start working it forward and see if it corroborates with anything else. And it really did not. It did not corroborate well with the Ice Age, uh, end of the last Ice Age, or with uh, changes we've been seeing. So... I didn't. I didn't get uh, a good hit, a good feel from that. Now Sitchin did the same thing. And I think he was about a thousand years off from thirty seven sixty. He he, he was uh, closer to four forty seven hundred BCE. He thought it crossed. Well, when I did the math on that one, it it still was, um, you know, two thousand years away or, mm -hmm. or two two hundred years away before it actually would affect us if that was true. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that didn't jive with some of the other evidence that we had that came that we're going to talk a lot about a little bit later. So hopefully if somebody had a true orbital table from the past and said definitively, here is a crossing that Nibiru came through, it, the whole thing would be solved. You know, you could easily look at the periodicity of the planet even if it's plus or minus some number of years on average it would it would come around about the same time sure sure so um let's get into the hey, enuma here, let's but talk here's about one thing that here's one thing we do know um it's been from our recorded history from oh i don't know uh since the biblical times we have not seen the kind of destruction that was assigned to this destroyer planet in Revelations called Wormwood that apparently drug meteors down the earth and all the other destructive things that is described in Revelations that is affiliated with this planet. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen that. So here we've gone, you know, 2015 years or so and not seen it. So in the, in the, in the best case, we're not going to see it for another, um, 1045 years. Best case scenario. In the worst case, it actually transited within that time period previous to the biblical times, about 1500 BCE or so. Now, if that's true, then it's due right now. Okay. So, so I did a table, uh, in the document to play around with uh, those kind of thoughts to see, you know, w what corroborates here. See the extremes and, of the situation. Exactly. So, so, so for me, um, Finding a fixed point in, in, in the past where it transited. Um, I'm going to scour this, the Sumerian records one more time and see if I can come up with something. But I thought I had one before at 3760 BC, but it doesn't fit. Sure. Gerald, let's go to the Enuma Illich. Let's talk about what we do now. Let's go into the solar system creation account. This is incredibly, um, sophisticated and telling about the, the Nibiru planet system. Yeah, when I first read this, it was it was kind of mishmashed to me. It was very long, too, about 11 tablets. And then um, I thought, you know, the only way to make sense of this is to sit down and correlate what their planet names are with our own. And once I did that and then found out a little bit more about who the players were that were pretending to be these, you know, it started out as this this family relationship that had offspring that became planets that turned into a, a celestial battle. And, and some key names showed up in there, by the way. Enki's name, well, he was called EA or Nudamud. He showed up in there. Um, his son, Nagshita, was referred to as Mumu there and was affiliated with the planet Mercury. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, uh, the, the, the short story of the Babylonian epic of creation is it appears that Nibiru and its satellites, moons, uh, maybe even had its own sun. We don't know. Um, was in an adjacent galaxy, is what it appears to have happened. Somehow, through the meandering through the galactic center, is my hypothesis, they got dislodged, at least their small portion did with their satellites, and it looks like there's up to five planets in the Nibiru constellation. Got dislodged, 
and ended up, according to this allegorical battle in the Enuma Elish, getting trapped into our solar system orbit in a retrograde orbit. Okay, so that's why it came in from the outside of Pluto. Well, <laughs> you know, in their account, they start talking about the different effects that uh, the inner planets in the solar system are going to have relative to their satellites. And they, this is where the battle part comes in, because what if there's a collision? What if this one gets tugged on here and causes this? So they go through this whole account, very scientific, if you understand now what it is they were talking about that uh, they did things to the planets in the inner orbit in order to avert collisions, including blowing a few things up and uh, redirecting or masking the radiance or the radiation from a couple of planets, like the sun. Very, very intense, very advanced scientific uh, understanding in this. So anyway, uh, in the first pass through, um, one of their satellites... Uh, uh, had some problems. There was an existing planet they called Tiamat that sits approximately where the Earth is now. Um, and through the uh, through the uh, um, perihelion transit, um, they describe all these actions they did. The second time through, though, they actually there was a collision with one of their satellites with Tiamat, mm -hmm. and this is what formed the half of it formed the Earth, part of it formed the Kingu, the Moon which is our moon, and the debris from that formed what they called the hammered bracelet, which is our asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So um, so it's a very detailed account. And uh, like I said, uh, this, was the, this was the document that was read in Babylon every spring under the auspices of Marduk, who was their chief deity, right? And uh, in that document, he had renamed Nibiru to Marduk. Mm -hmm. And and they called it the planet of crossing. Well, so we find out that it's in a retrograde orbit, and that where it crosses the either the solar ecliptic or the point at perihelion was what made it famous as this planet of crossing, because apparently it it reshines or re resonates or radiates the radiation from the sun. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very large planet. Uh, according to the, the data we're going to get into, it's four times larger than Jupiter. Now think about this. It had to be larger than Jupiter in order to cause Jupiter and Neptune and Uranus to end up with these tilts in their orbit. Mm -hmm. It had to be a very large planet for that to happen. So now, uh, as you'll see, it, it looks to be about 17 times bigger than the Earth and about four times bigger than Jupiter. So with that said, um, its magnetic effect, its, its pull on the Earth would be quite significant if it were it to come within some close proximity. And so that, that could explain a lot of the past pole shifts, the, uh, the change in our magnetic flux that's happening on the Earth now. It's mm -hmm. been moving significantly. And so something something is causing that. So I, I, I postulated to you earlier, and I didn't really put this in here, that, you know, we were also told by the Mayans that we'd be you know, going through the galactic center about 20, 2011, 2013, somewhere in there. Okay, some people think it was winter solstice 2012, and uh, Ian Lungold said, no, it was October 2011. So that if that was the case, it could explain adjacent planets warming up it could potentially explain the gravitational north pole changing um, and a lot of the other earth changes we're seeing mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the same time at the same time if my theory my hypothesis was true in the first place that the the great year this passage through the galactic center could be the, the disturbance force that caused Nibiru's constellation to get caught up in our solar system in the first place well if that is the case then those two events would be correlated. So, so this Mayan prediction and that and Nibiru's return could be correlated because of that reason. Sure. Yeah. We're talking something like, a, uh, when we say a planet, it's most likely something like a, a failed second sun, Gerald. Is it safe to say that? Is that probably the best guess we've got at the moment? It's like a failed second sun, like a, dwar a red dwarf or brown dwarf well, that's got it's, satellite it's planets. A, 
use whatever term you want. Its effect on light is what's important because of its ability to be observed. And according to uh, Dr. Harrington and Dr. Neugebauer, who was from uh, JPL, and this is in the 19, 1980, early 81 or so, uh, they were discussing uh, the infrared satellite um, settings that would be needed to detect this planet. And they said something very telling. They said uh, <clears throat> that the planet is so cold that they had to, unless you had an instrument that could be cooled to minus four, uh, 20 degrees above, minus 425 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. that you would not be able to detect it. So you've got to super cool your, in, your instrument in order to detect this thing because it's not reflecting light. It's in the infrared. Okay, so... So is that a failed star? I don't know. It could still have it could still have magma inside it, you know, but uh, the surface of the planet is very cold. Sure. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Uh, Giorgio de Santiano in Hamlet's Mill talks about Neugebauer's um, uh, data as well. Um, you know, he gets into a lot of the astronomical stuff as well. Um, there is no doubt, though, that the amount of context we have for this Nibiru in historical text, though, Gerald, and I want to focus a little bit on this. This is very okay. important. We can do some of the science and, and, and the astronomy right. in a bit. But, uh, I mean, the, the amount of times we have this uh, Nibiru planet mentioned, uh, for either Nibiru or Marduk, um, no, it, the way that you describe it, there is nothing else that can fit this other than a planet, Gerald. I mean, it, it's not a star because a star just doesn't do what this thing is supposed to do. Yes, it does reflect a lot of light because of the nature of its of what it is and how it comes into our solar system. But um, there's only one thing that fits this, and that's like a, a a planet with a very long oval trajectory. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, you go all the way back to the late 1700s. Uh, there were uh, the first people that were using telescopes uh, that were searching for whatever they they hadn't even found Pluto yet. Okay, they we didn't find. Pluto until the 1930s. These guys were focused on what is disturbing the outer planets. A real physical, tangible question. What's dis what what is so large that disturbed them off of the solar ecliptic? They wanted to know, and it's still a valid question today. Okay, something tangible that had a interactive effect, either collision or a magnetic or gravitational effect change the orbit of these very massive planets. Mm -hmm. And that that has been a search for the astronomical community for a very long time. And it turns out that Tombaugh, who was working for, uh, who was he? I think he was with the IRS. I think he was with the IRS program, too. Mm -hmm. He or, or I can't remember where he's from, but he actually got accredited with finding Pluto in the 1930s. But it was by accident. They were actually looking for what this big object was that could have affected our outer giants, planetary giants. Sure, wow, incredible, Gerald. Gerald, I mean, let's get into Sitchin, in step Sitchin in '76. Uh, he brings in this um, incredible tablet. Um, this sorry, this um imprint of a cylinder seal um the famous photograph uh, but it's a photograph of a cylinder seal it's in the berlin museum it's known as va243 not a very illustrious name gerald but uh, very VA, controversial yeah uh va243 yeah. probably the most controversial cylinder seal in existence you know i love cylinder seals gerald, so uh, i know i actually i actually put this in the document because egypt to find out about the history of the, the greek people in particular about atlantis um, they told him there were multiple floods, four major ones, and multiple minor ones. Mm -hmm. So we don't. So we don't. So what I was trying to do with this first point was <clears throat> using the uh, dates of the rulership. Could we land at Noah's flood, which we believe, I believe personally, was uh, at the end of the last ice age. So I think it was about 10,000 BC. Personally, some people believe it was 2,900 BC. So this this is where it comes down to is if you could figure pinpoint that and you believe the assumption that it was caused by Nibiru, you'd have a passage point in history. Okay, this is one of the angles I tried to come at it from. Uh, and I did multiple angles, <laughs> as any scientist would, to try to get to the truth here. And that's what's going to come out tonight, uh, hopefully. And I <laughs> I was actually surprised at the outcome. So I'm actually very pleased, just <laughs> to let you know up, up front. 
Now, so I followed this. So what did I do? I said, well, Anki says he landed here between 450,000 years ago, according to Sitchin's timetable. And in some of the other sources, it could have been earlier, as early as 360,000 years ago. So I took the conservative one, 360,000 years, subtracted 240,400 from the first rulers from the Sumerian kings list that ended with a borrowed tutu. And uh, I came up with, uh, what did I come up with? hundred I think 119,000, something like that. So what, so that, oh yeah, it was 119,600 years. So I looked at that and said, well, that may have been a flood, but it certainly wasn't the 10,000 BCE. So I found, I thought that was a dead end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the thing that was in question there was what was the actual date to use from Enki's arrival in order to start from prehistory and go forward to the flood. All right. So that was the first attempt. The next attempt was to go, okay, well, let's go after the flood. Find the Sumerian king, because we have all their reigns, so we have the time that we could accumulate. Find a Sumerian king that was documented to be in the record so that we had a firm date in stone that he was actually a ruler there, and then work backwards to see what that time was for the flood. So I did that as well. And their total uh, rulership for all the way to the point where they switched cities was 17,980 years, and that ended with Aga. Of Kish. Okay. So uh, just prior to him was en, en Mebarajsi, and he served for 900 years. And according to this, he was the earliest ruler on the list that was confirmed independently from epigraphical sources. So I thought, okay, well, let's start from him, work backwards to the flood date that was given at the end of the first part of the king's list, and see where that landed us. Because he, so, so you just take 2600 and start. Uh, adding these dates of these previous rulers, uh, so add 2,600 to about 16,000, and and all of a sudden you see again you're not close to, uh, the, to the 2,900 BCE flood that they claim, and also the one that we think happened at uh, the end of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the problem with that approach, and so I found that as a dead end as well. From a scientific standpoint, it doesn't hold water. Sure. Um, yeah. But they said there was a there was a great flood there. So uh, it looks like in the if you work backwards and just using the last king on the on the list, that was seventeen thousand nine hundred and eighty years. Let's call it eighteen thousand plus uh, twenty six hundred. So that would be almost twenty thousand B.C., uh, which is way longer than the one that we were trying to work to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so I, I really didn't. It really didn't help me that much. Now, it says that in 2900 BC, uh, they did find a sediment layer all the way up to uh, an area. I think it was Sapar. No, no, it was, they found localized flooding at Shurupak and, and other layers that they found. And they radiocarbon dated it to 2900 BC. But this could have been one of the minor floods too. So it doesn't really, you know, it, it's not convincing to me. You know, I just read an article uh, before I did the show. Actually, for a multitude of different reasons, uh, I was doing Irish mythology, and there is a sunken, uh, not a sunken city, there's a buried city on the west coast of Ireland that's been buried with flood deposit. It's some sort of a black uh, mud or flood layer. Purports to be about 4000 BC, Gerald. Uh, it looks like there was a tsunami came in of some sort and hit the west of Ireland and buried a settlement there. Um but it, yeah, well, another piece of evidence I had from way back in history it just came to me. When I was going back and forth to Turkey, I remember them finding this vessel um, in the Sea of Marmara that apparently had been washed there from a flood that came in through the north from the Black Sea that spilled over the Strait of Bosphorus and washed this vessel down uh, into the bottom of the, of, the, of the ocean there. And they also found a bunch of farmhouses at the bottom of the Black Sea. Maybe the thing never made it over the Strait of Bosphorus, but... It was at the bottom of the sea, the Black Sea or the Sea of Marmar. And they date, they dated when they thought this event happened. And it turned out to be approximately 10,000 BCE, which was, you know, or, you know, I'm sorry, about 10,000 years ago, which was about 12,000 BCE. And it turned out to be, you know, at the end of the last ice age. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, evidence shows that a lot of the waters all around the Mediterranean rose a significant portion around that same time. So I think that was the, the flood of Noah. And, and, you know, there, there's been multiple ones, though. So this, this planet is, is flood prone. Sure.
Sure. You know, it's, inc- it's an important line of inquiry for Nibiru, though, Gerald. I, I, I get why you started yeah, off like that. Right. Because if Nibiru is coming close to us, we're going to get flood activity. We're going to get... It depends how close it crosses, though. If, if it's a planet of the crossing, uh, which, which is what it's described as, it depends how close it gets to us, Gerald. Do I mean, there's sometimes it comes past us in, in, in the orbit and it doesn't affect us that much, though, Gerald. Is that correct? That's right. It really just, it really just depends on whether... Um, <clears throat> It, where the Earth is when it causes its disturbances with the sun. And, you know, so if it's, if, whether it's on the leeward or the windward side, essentially, you know. Sure. So if you're on the, if you're on the downward side where the radiation could come off the sun and strike the Earth due to its interactions with Nibiru, then, then that's a real problem. So, uh, on top of that, I guess one of the worst problems is the magnetic effect, uh, in causing the planet to wobble about it. Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and I'm delighted to have my good friend Gerald Clark and a returning guest back today. And we got a special show today. Uh, we have been doing a series of podcasts on his latest book, uh, Seventh Planet Mercury Rising. But today we're going to take a little break from those podcasts uh, for a breather. And uh, we're still going to be on the subject of uh, the Anunnaki, and we're going to talk about their home planet of Nibiru. And uh, this is going to be a Nibiru special. And I asked Gerald to do this for a specific reason because, well, there is quite a Nibiru frenzy out there, and uh, you know, um, big questions: is it is it real? Is it is it coming our way? Um, we're going to get into that, but I, I don't want to do a normal show. I want to do this from a scientific and logical perspective, and there's no better person to do this than Gerald Clark. And uh, of course, you can follow um, Gerald Clark's work on GeraldClark77.com. Uh, you can see everything that Gerald does there, and he has a wealth of information on the Sumerian culture, and he is an independent Assyriologist, and I, I like to coin that term for Gerald because it's exactly what he is. Um, but today we're going to focus on Nibiru and we're going to get into, you know, so many things. What we know, analysis, everything we've got, everything we've got. And we're going to synthesize the data that's out there uh, with the purpose of coming up with some answers for the public because the people really are hungry for this and it's incredibly important. Uh, um, so without further ado, let's bring on today's guest. Hi, Gerald. You're very welcome back to Capricorn Radio. Hey, buddy. It's really good to be back. And <clears throat> it is uh, timely that we do this. We said we said we were going to do it, and so I think it, it, you know. And based on spending an entire week of focused on nothing but looking into this, I think uh, I think we have a lot to share. Sure, uh, Gerald. Just for the, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, in preparation for this, you've actually wrote an article. I, I call it an article because it's, it's a quite a large document, Gerald. Uh, it's like a mini book, to be honest with you. Uh, and you are prolific in everything you do, Gerald, and that's why I asked you particularly for this show today uh, to do this from a scientist's uh, perspective and a, and a logical perspective. And you have the goods in that respect, uh, Gerald. Um, but I'm just going to refer people to uh, this document, this article that you have done on the Nibiru analysis, and uh, you'll catch that in the YouTube description. Uh, you'll have a link to your site for that as well, GeraldClark77.com. It's an incredibly important document you've done too, Gerald, because you have done analysis with graphs, tables, um uh, King's List, you've, you, you've tried the, uh, that many angles to try and figure out any information we can about Nibiru. Um, like, like I say, is it coming our way? Is it even real? What do we know about it? What, what can we, what can we guess and what can we reduce down to, you know, at least a window of, uh, a, a window of opportunity of kind of, you know, pinpointing some sort of estimation on anything to do with this whole, whole scenario. But, uh, so I'll just refer to the audience to that, Gerald. But I, I guess, um, for me, the, 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 the first thing, and I want to mention this, Gerald, is, is Hamlet's Mill. For me, the, the, the Nibiru source that I first came across was Hamlet's Mill, uh, a book by, uh, Giorgio de Santiano and Hirsch von Decken. And, you know, it, it's an archaeoastronomy Bible, if you will. And, you know, it's been around since the 50s and 60s, Gerald. Uh, in, in, in um, this is an MIT professor, a history of science and, uh, uh, you know, he's been fully uh, aware of this whole Nibiru, saying that it was the brightest star in the sky. He says there's many other tales in the Sumerian stuff, but this is one that people are going to have to wake up to, and they have to get over this uh, label of mythology and start looking at this in an archaeoastronomy aspect, putting in this comparative mythology and archaeoastronomy and trying to synthesize it, Gerald. Yeah, I just looked at <clears throat> the reference that you gave me on that book, Mm-hmm. And I was reading through the portion that he was discussing on the Enuma Elish and talking about uh, the names of the planets in their 
particular celestial battle. And uh, I was I was fascinated to see that he had access to a version where he was using the name of the Anunnaki home planet, calling it Nibiru, not Marduk, the way the ba old Babylonian version did. Once once Marduk was in ascendancy, he he re changed the Enuma Elish so that he made their home planet his name. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew this, and Sitchin knew it as well. But I, I was looking for another source that would corroborate that, and this one did it. Oh, and awesome. I was really excited to see that. Awesome. Yeah, and of course, uh, I, I'm going to link that up in the box as well, Gerald, for people that want to follow Hamlet's Meal. It's actually a, it's a, it's a book that you can get. You can get the whole book online. Uh, it's got many ancient cultures in there. It's got many things in there from uh, basically the history of procession and, you know, a lot of archaeoastronomy, all the alternative archaeoastronomers today, they all draw source material from this book. It, it was like, you know, one of the most important books of the 20th century for me, Gerald. Um, and it's got so much in it. Uh, it's just, it's, it, there's a small segment on Nibiru in there. And there's many stuff in there about Sumerian and yeah, Babylon. I, I think it's, a, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing that it goes back to the 1950s as well. Mm. Um, oh, some of this research does, you know, it's like it's been floating around down there. Um, uh, you know, we're going to get to Harrington's research as well. Um, we're going to get some of the ERAS data and the satellite stuff. We're going to get some of the science, Gerald. But, I mean, let's talk about the Sumerians' kings list. Uh, I want you to tell me, you know, what what this has got to do with Nibiru. Why why the flood significance to Nibiru? Uh, and tell me why we're going to get into the Sumerian kings list first to tackle the Nibiru question. Well, you know, when I first started talking about Sumerians, I had to talk about a couple of stories out of the Bible that would connect the Western culture over to uh, the Middle Eastern uh, historical record. And one of those was the story of Noah, of course. Well, in that story, everybody knows it ended in a flood. So people have tried to pin down when Noah's flood is to determine when that was to use it as a marker point in history. Well, if it's true that that flood was caused by the passage of Nibiru, then you could use that point in time to say, okay, it passed here. Let's, uh, add another 3,600 years, 3,600, and, you know, we'll see when's it going to come by again. That's, that's the whole idea. Mm. So the reason the Sumerian Kings list is important is because it lists at the end of the first, uh, rulership, and it took 240,400 years. This is table one from the document I wrote. Then the flood swept over. And uh, then the next document picks up for the Sumerian Kings list and says, after the flood. So it's talking about a great flood that happened. Now, the question is, is that Noah's flood? Because we know from Solon, when he went to, to the city of Sais, and I knew how much you loved cylinder seals. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, some fun. I had a little bit of fun with this one. But uh, I like your analysis, you know, though, Gerald. I like your analysis. Now, I'm going to again refer the audience to the, to the, the book or the document, the article that you wrote in the, in the YouTube description. And then, you know, get a copy of this because it's got all the pictures, tables, data, and the analysis all there. Um, very, very similar document, Gerald. But, you know, I, I'll be honest, I mean, I, I just looked at this as just a pure picture, and it's only when I see the analysis that you've done, Gerald, with the relative sizes of the, and, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of criticism of this, but the criticism, Gerald, uh, that you have seems to have dispelled here for me, uh, I mean, it's great because it's, it, it seems like a no-brainer. This, it's showing relative sizes, Gerald, and, uh, it's, it looks like it is actually, uh, you know, um, Nibiru in the center. I mean, it doesn't look like it's a star, you know, or a sun. Or it's bizarre. Yeah, well, so I'll give a little background. So um, this very controversial uh, cylinder seal, and, and I know I know how difficult it must have been to etch this thing on stone and roll this thing out now that you look at the detail. And uh, anyway, um, in between two of the beings on the top left, it looks like... Um, a primitive worker is being led by the hand and introduced to an Anunnaki deity that's seated with the plow. And I'll have to go and decode uh, the cuneiform that's on there. It's not hard. We have a cuneiform script and a dictionary now, so anybody can do it. And I'll look at see, see what some of the words say on here. But uh, just looking at it from the historical record, um, it was interesting to me because, number one, it shows a circle with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven star or seven points around it. Okay. And the Anunnaki oftentimes used uh, uh, a star symbol to refer, represent different planets. Mm -hmm. So a five, a five, a 
seven-pointed star, refer to the Earth, the six-pointed, Mars. And, and from there, Enuma Elish, that we assign numbers to the planets based on working from the outside in, from Pluto inward, and then theirs ending up as the 12th planet because they were the last ones in. So that's how we ended up calling the Earth the seventh planet. All right. Sure. So anyway, so this, this cylinder seal that Titchen was so um, focused on had uh, in between this primitive worker and this uh, liaison that was going to introduce him to his enslaved role as a farmer working with the plow, right in between them was uh, this star looking symbol, a very large circular uh, dot in between. And then um, several other dots around them that were looked like planets around an orbit, okay, around a sun, around a central sun, you know, just like our solar system. And so uh, it turns out that Sitchin was very excited about that because there weren't just nine planets, there were ten. So he believed that they were talking about an additional planet in our solar system that we hadn't accounted for, even in the 1930s when we found Pluto. Okay. Mm. So on the cylinder seal, it became controversial as, as to using it as a source, whether there was another planet out there or not. Okay. So he wrote about this in the 12th planet. Um, this controversy, uh, I don't know, kind of came to a head, uh, even more so after his death. But basically, what do, what can we take this, these dots or these circles and this central sun looking, uh, picture to mean uh, could it be representational of a chronology in time when the plow was given to mankind so it's commemorating some uh, ephemeris if you were to look at those as well are these the planets and the and the zodiacal houses are in at the time is this a is this a time marker to commemorate this event or is it a indication of where the earth was at the time when the event, just the Earth itself, because it's got a sun with seven points on it. Mm -hmm. So that means it's uh, it's pretty specific to the radiation that's hitting the seventh planet to me. Not that it's the seventh planet, okay? Because it's shown much larger than the other sphere. So all of a sudden you go, well, why are the why are the sphere the circles different sizes? Mm -hmm. And all so so this kind of led to a lot of questions, and um, a lot of people have attacked uh, the theory of. Nibiru even existing just simply based on this single piece of evidence, which I think is absurd. But some people have done it, okay? So uh, okay. I decided to, I don't know, take another look at this and see if there's anything else we could glean from uh, what they were saying on this seal. See, you know, is that... Now, there's a, there's a historical story that came from some of Sitchin's writings and others that even in the Cain and Abel story from the Sumerians, we had... Anunnaki siblings from the Enkiite and Enlilite clan interacting with them. For instance, uh, according to the story, um, Abel, the son of, uh, of Adam, you know, there was Cain and Abel. Well, uh, Abel was taught to do farming by Ninurta, which was, which was uh, Enlil's son. The warrior Ninurta was also known as Apollo. Well, the Cain portion, the Cain, the Cain offspring was taught herdsmanship and, and cattle management by none other than Marduk. And then you have the biblical story of uh, uh, Cain and Abel and Cain killing Abel with a stone because he didn't receive the same praise from Enki that uh, Ab that uh, Cain did for meat production okay mm -hmm. so it was kind of a very crazy story and a very crazy tie-in with the anunnaki so so i thought well let's let's look at these orbs on here and see if in knowing knowing that you studied cylinder seals and they are very precise i mean just crazy precise how how they could even do this in the first place so would they have haphazardly drawn these on here and is you know can it tell us anything so i started looking into that okay mm -hmm. so um i i glommed on to someone else's research who had and this is shown in figure three va 243 uh, planet numbering basically starting from the smallest circle on that blown up picture from va 243 and assigning numbers to it um you you could you'll end up with uh one through twelve okay sure and the smallest one probably